So here we are, this is the 2023 Distress Christmas release. Now, the whole thing that if you, if you miss the, the Distress Halloween live, I'll just kind of do a little recap of how Ranger handled the Distress seasonal this year. And I am thrilled, I gotta say, I am thrilled about this. Um, because in addition to the new colors, these sets right here, these six colors are new for 2023. Uh, Ranger also brought back the mica stains for 2022 and 2021 so these are all available so if you missed out on the previous years you can you can pick these up so the whole idea about this product being seasonal mica stain is a mix of distress stain and a mica powder and these colors are unique certainly inspired by the distress palette but unique in their final uh, results so a shout out to uh, brian and the, the lab at ranger for for creating these colors and and making it all happen uh, and I do love that we have a palette. And today I think we're gonna focus more on the palette in general than, than actually the new new, but I just wanna talk about what, what was new for, for 2023. So we have these two new kits. So this kit, this light kit, I, I think this, is, this one's five and this is six, but I prefer them uh, this way, so I just set it up. Uh, Sugary Gumdrop, Wonderland, and Frosty Mint, that is in one of the sets. Juniper Berry, Yuletide, and Frozen Fog, and we're gonna get into Frozen Fog and what makes it magical. Um, this has all been shipping worldwide with the exception of the crayons. And I talked about the seasonal crayons uh, for Halloween as well. The seasonal crayons for both Halloween and Christmas are due to ship from Ranger later this month. So definitely uh, check with your retailer if they maybe have a waiting list or something like that, uh, if you're interested in the crayons. And I'll talk about those as well. Uh, the crayons though did not come back for all the years. So if you see any crayons out there for older sets, know that they, they did not come back. So you wanna get them when you get them because I'm not sure if crayons, uh, these crayons actually will, will ever return for future seasonal runs. Who knows? I'm not sure how Ranger is going to handle seasonal after this, but I will tell you that the seasonal palette is complete and that's what we're gonna focus on today. Then of course we have uh, Grip Paste Snowfall. So this is a Grip Paste that came back for another year, but we have the new Texture Paste Sparkle. And wait till you see this because if you think uh, that you're like, oh, it's a glitter paste. You just wait and see. So that's the launch. We're gonna get right into colors because I wanna talk about everything and I've got stuff just ready to go and ready to play and we're gonna talk about organizing and all of that. I have a, thanks Mario. Yes, yes. I was gonna say I have a little basket set up so I can just get this stuff off. The only thing I'm gonna hold on to are the paste. Ah, there we go. There we are. All right, let me, um, I think I'll, I'll start here. <laughs> I was like, do I wanna bring out the medium mat yet? No, not yet. Okay. Let's just talk colors, shall we? So the thing about this palette, when I started doing the seasonal palette, really the, the inspiration, the idea for this palette was that it was going to be a seasonal palette and I was only designing two years worth of colors, okay? And that would make 24 colors. And, and the idea would be to alternate those colors from year to year. But uh, Alan at Ranger, uh, one of the owners at Ranger, really said, I would, I, I really think we should do new colors for 2023. I don't know. I just think there's something about it. And I'm like, uh, I really didn't plan on it. But of course, once I got into it, you don't have to talk me into to doing new colors. Like that's like I was in. However, I did say this is, this is going to be it for the palette. And I see that many of you guys really love this palette. Hey, I see Susan. Hey, hey, Susie. Hey, Vicky. I see Vicky here as well. So this, I will tell you, wraps up the seasonal palette. There will not be new colors next year. So the seasonal palette is 36 colors. And that is what I want to talk about today because all along, even though these were launched for Halloween and Christmas, it is a seasonal product, meaning this isn't something that is made uh, throughout the year where it's kept on the shelves. Ranger makes the batch of it for seasonal, ships it out to retailers. And when it's gone, it's gone for the season. Like I said, will it come out next year? I don't know. I think it'd be great if they kept bringing the colors back every year, but I'm really not sure. Okay. Um, yes, Mindy, I really am sure. Um, so these are the, the current or the existing colors, and these are the new ones. And so I'm just going to kind of talk in how they, how they feed in. So I'm going to, I'm going to set this set aside because I think this is the one that's like red, white, and blue, which I think confused a lot of people in a seasonal run, but you'll see why we needed it. We'll talk about this one. Cause this is just such a beautiful addition. So this one is called Sugary Gumdrop. If you look at the color, it's certainly inspired by uh, saltwater taffy. It is that kind of peachy, corally pink, uh, beautiful, completely different than winterberry. So when you see them side by side. And the thing about a mica stain, again, it is a 
colorant, a stain, with a coordinating color mica. So the mica in this, the powder, is a blended combination of colors, so the, the pearl matches the ink. So when you look at it, you can just see ink, but then when it catches the light, you see the shimmer that should match the ink versus just a, a whiteout. Because sometimes there are pearl products where they just add a white pearl to everything, and then when the light hits it, you get that flash of white. Here, you're, you're going to get a flash of that color. So sugary gumdrop, really good. My swatches, I just like to do my swatches on uh, white distressed watercolor cardstock and distressed craft heavy stock because those are the two that I would use this product on the most. And that's why I only swatch on the surface that I actually work on with that product. So uh, can you swatch it on black and all those other things? Absolutely, you, you do whatever works for you. But I love that white is always gonna show me the truest form of the color with the mica. Craft, it's still going to stain that. The lighter colors are going to be less prominent because it is an ink. But to me, the mica shows up completely different on craft than it does on white. So sometimes you really want to work, work that way. This one, beautiful color. This is Wonderland. I love this color. This is kind of, I don't know, it's, it's kind of salvage patina-ish, but, but a lot of tumbled glass-ish. It's just that really light blue color. So when I look in the swatches, I'll just show you, you know, as we go through here, this bright blue, this one right here, snow flurries, you can see it's kind of a bright blue, but you can see how much lighter that is. And then if we go back one, with, which was shiny bobble, which is kind of Peacock Feather Mermaid Lagoon, you can also see how much lighter that is. It's just a really pretty color. And again, beautiful on white and craft. Then this one, oh, <laughs> this one's really good. Uh, crack Pistachio fans will know, and it's, it's pretty much Crack Pistachio with just, a, it's a little bit lighter than that, but this is Frosty Mint. Um, I do love this color because you can see that, I was just trying to show, like when the light hits it, Look at it on craft. It just has such a frosty look, but on watercolor, it's very minty. And that one is going to be very different than Merry Mint. So we have Frosty Mint and Merry Mint, two very different greens. You can see this one is a little bit more intense, but beautiful for holly leaves and that sort of thing. And then that Frosty, my gosh, so, so good. Um, crayons. That's how the crayons are going to look. You can see that these crayons, the seasonal crayons, if you wonder how are they different than regular distress crayons, they have that same mica property, that little shimmer. Not as shimmery as, as the mica stains, but have a touch of shimmer nonetheless. They are water reactive, so you can watercolor. And of course, same thing I swatch on. You can see how that mica really shines so much different on, on craft compared to watercolor, but beautiful nonetheless. All right. Then we'll get into this set, which again, I saw uh, on social, everyone's like, oh, it's great for 4th of July, America. Yes, yes, and yes. But my goal was to always create a, a full seasonal palette and how the colors broke down was just like, well, this one's gonna be red, white, and blue. It is what it is, and, and I'm okay with that. So this blue color, this juniper berry, this is like, this is a bit of uncharted mariner uh, and a little, a little touch of green. Okay, so we wanted to make it a little bit greener but like juniper berry is sometimes very bluish and sometimes bluish green but this is a cool cool color let me get to the the blue zone so you can see in the blues of what we had we certainly had that shiny bobble um, we have frosted juniper which is kind of like ice spruce and then i think this one is this winter frost yes winter frost which is kind of a, a steel blue but then that was it then we kind of went right into green so you take a look and see how that color plays in we definitely needed that, oh, it's just a good blue. But it's interesting because, you know, when you put it on different surfaces, like this one, it has a, on craft, it has a really deep undertone, almost, almost chip sapphire-ish, because that blue is translucent dye, it becomes darker over brown. So a lot of fun that you can have with the mica stains. Then this red, definitely inspired by Lumberjack plaid, I'm not gonna lie, it's a, is a good, good red. Um, I would say like a bluer red in comparison to what, what's already there. So peppermint stick is just more of that, I don't know, kind of warmer red, which wasn't bad at all. Then tart cranberry, there we go. If I do it this way, I'm not fighting with the ring. Uh, peppermint stick and tart cranberry, really nice reds, but you can see this one has kind of a, a pinky pearl. This one has just a, a little bit of a warmer pearl, but then take a look at this is Yuletide. Look at that color. 
So in the world of reds for a mica stain, you can see how we were able to, to really take that, that deep bluish red yum and, and do it and take a look at it on craft. Oh my gosh, it is good. It is a good, good red. Means business though. And then we have frozen fog. Now the thing about a mica stain, okay, is that it, it does start out as a colorant. Like I said, it has, it's, it's a base of ink mixed with a pearl. And I know a lot of people said, oh, I wish you would do a white mica stain and I want a white mica stain. Well, because white is not a dye, white is a pigment, I couldn't do that because we couldn't put pigments in here because the pigment would cover up the mica. So it needed to be a colorant. But of course, with the launch of Lost Shadow in the world of distress, that really, really faint gray, I was like, there we go. Could we kind of take that Lost Shadow, make it as light as possible so you get a little bit of the undertone? but then put that beautiful white pearl in it. So this is frozen fog. And so this, what I was saying, it's like when people said you kind of need a white, I'm like, stay, stay tuned. So this is really um, a beautiful wintry white. It does have a gray undertone if you're gonna use it on, on white, but it, it makes a beautiful wintry frozen top coat because of that silvery white. It's beautiful. And yeah, I just saw Carla said it's a great moon color. Yes, I agree, it would be. So if you look here at the palette of grays, if you will, or white, you know, between Iron Gate and Empty Tomb, you can see really nice how, how that plays in. And it would be very different than, let me see, I know I have the other colors in here, I think. Yeah, so Phantom Mist, okay? Because you might be like, well, Halloween, like Phantom Mist was kind of a, it's completely different, see? It's so much lighter. And I think that's the importance of swatches is to kind of see, see how everything goes. So my my swatches, I've got a ring for, for watercolor and a ring for craft, and these will, these will go in. And you can see same thing on the crayons. Now the crayons, I will say, um, especially on these colors, are much lighter. It was just that if we tried to make them too dark, you couldn't see the pearl. And even here, as dark as they are, I think the pearl shows up better on craft. So I will tell you that from the crayons, let me put it on watercolor just so see like to me it's still a really nice red but it's not as deep as it is in the mica stain and that's to be expected because we're talking about you know inks a, a dye where the crayons are only pigment so they don't have that punch of color uh, when it comes to dyes so those are the colors these will end up going into uh, general population i always love to finish off my swatches but i won't do that right now as much as i want to but they're already punched labeled ready to go but that's all right, they will, they will be here. So let's talk about the pastes and we'll get into that and then we'll kind of keep, we'll keep going. We'll talk about really, I think the whole idea with this seasonal line and what you can do. So one paste that I was so happy uh, came back is Snowfall and Snowfall Grit Paste uh, to me is a, an underappreciated paste. I think it's, a, it's one of those pastes that maybe you Very don't, it is because I think people don't understand it because if you've been crafting for many years at Christmas time, we always have like a, some sort of jars of snowy texture stuff that shows up in the craft stores. And you might look at that and go, oh yeah, I already have a white paste, but this isn't white. That's the thing about Snowfall, okay? It is a translucent paste. And because it is a translucent paste, it has this beautiful, sparkly, glittery property, but not glitter glitter, more icy, more snowy this dries translucent and because it dries translucent i've talked about this before we have the ability to color our paste so this is a grit paste which means it's going to have those those gritty granules in it this is a fairly new jar so i haven't done the press and seal yet but it will once i once i use a little bit more but you can see that it dries to a really nice texture so it's perfect for snow on cards you can spread it around you can use your finger you can do all of those uh, just to add a little bit of texture. But from a color perspective, the smoother it is, or the thinner it is, the more translucent it becomes. So you can see the difference between how thick it is to where when you spread it out really thin. So it just depends whether you want, you know, an ice storm blizzard or just a little bit of that, okay? Even on craft, you can see that when it's really thin, it becomes very translucent, but the heavier it is, you see more of the white, but there is no white in here. Everything about this is translucent which means coloring it is pretty magical. Um, you can color this with your Distress reinkers. I'll talk a little bit about this because I'm gonna demo that today about tinting your pastes. But it's really nice because you can get this textural, icy, 
thing. And this to me goes beyond the snowfall part of this paste. This goes into, it's just a texture that has that snowy vibe. So this could be for candy, for gumdrops, for Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. Exactly, <laughs> candy. Uh, for Valentine's Day, if you wanted to add a little sparkle to uh, the heart because you're gonna get a little texture, you could do peach. Um, you can do that, that kind of marigold. And I know you're like, oh, I don't want yellow snow. It's not about snow. This is about like lemon ice or something icy. Look at this one, bundled sage adding a little cracked pistachio. So these are distress reinkers, not oxide. Oxide would have a pigment and that pigment would not allow this to be translucent. So it would really, uh, and it wouldn't allow it to sparkle either. So you want to use a dye reinker. And if you don't have distress, you can do other things. Uh, you can use any other uh, water-based dye reinker. You should not use alcohol ink because solvent is not uh, friendly with a water-based medium. So a water-based reinker for your ink pads will work uh, to color this, but take a look at that one. Yeah, it could be for slushies, it could be on top of ice cream, it could be uh, really on so many different, I'm thinking food, but it could be used even on flowers, on stars, moons, clouds, anything. Look at the these purple, beautiful, right? Shaded lilac, I think, is this milled lavender? I think so, yeah, that's milled lavender. So that's a way that, that we can we can work on snowfall. But then we're gonna talk about the new one, the one that I'm really excited about and a shout out to, uh, to Ranger really for their patience on this one because I knew what I wanted <laughs> and I, I wasn't gonna settle for anything other than what I had in my head. And here's what I had in my head. The whole idea with Texture Paste Sparkle was I wanted something that mimicked that retro Formica, that table like at a diner that had that shine with these little flecks of glitter around it. And you might think, oh, sparkle paste. Well, all right, Captain Obvious, way to, way to finally catch up because you have a glitter paste. This is not a, it's not a glitter paste, so to speak, meaning what you might see as an industry standard where you spread it on and it's like packed with glitter. That's not really what I wanted. I wanted it just to be a little bit more sparkly. So what sparkle is, it is a translucent. What sparkle is, is that it's beautiful. It is beautiful. <laughs> I love that stuff. It is a translucent paste. So you can see on the top that it's a translucent paste with a gloss finish when it dries and it's got little flecks of glitter in it. And when I say little flecks of glitter, this is what I'm talking about. So it's got that shine, but let me just, there we go. We'll hold it up to the camera. You see those little flecks of glitter? Those little bits of glitter allow all of this space underneath to be open. So instead of covering something with a glitter paste, Sparkle is going to be a high gloss. So you can see that shine. Just It looks wet, but it's totally dry. So you have that, and it's flexible, totally flexible. So it's kind of like, you know, think of like a flexible ultra thick, but the glitter in it, and we go, I'll get as close to the camera before it blurs out, has these little flecks of sparkle yum. Come on. Come on. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. You're right, Mario. All right, so let's put this up here and let's just talk about what we're going to do with it. Okay, so the, th am I good? good? There we go. Good. Okay, Mario's always making sure that the angles are right. Okay, so the thing about oh, sparkle, threw snowfall in there already, is that it can be used many ways. And that's where, um, that's where I'm gonna start. We'll start with that and then we'll kind of go into other things with the mica stains and all that. But I really wanted to explain this to you because again, if you don't see a video, or you don't know a demo, you just read it by its name and you're like, I have glitter paste, moving on, okay? It's very, very unique. The first thing to know about this is that it allows us to do many things. One, of course, being coloring it. So just like we did Snowfall, when Mario and I started working on these last night, I couldn't stop. I go, we'll just make a few. And once I started, I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to do more, I need to do more. So take a look at all of these tinted versions of sparkles. So you could have a really faint, pink sparkle you could have and these are all using distress reinkers and i'll show you how quick it is to mix it up look at that one where you have a, a beautiful saltwater taffy or picked raspberry and you have and depending on the color that you choose that's what's going to kind of change the look of that sparkle so the more saturated the color is the more i think it covers the glitter and the less the less i think sparkly take a look at this one dried marigold so it kind of has a, a peachy vibe. Look at that for Halloween. Mm -mm. Carved pumpkin, so good. 
You can even do this with rusty hinge. And I'm not sure if the camera's picking it up. I'll have photos posted on the blog because really, I mean, you guys know as makers, it's really hard to, to have glitter show up on video, especially when you have a shine, but my gosh. Squeeze lemonade, I'll just go really quick. Fossilized amber. I, I just couldn't stop. I was like, oh, I needed to see it in crushed olive. Let's see how that looks. And oh, I wanted to see it in peeled paint. And I wanted to see it in twisted citron because I think that would be good for Halloween. There you go. Look how there. If I'm closer, you can see the glitter. Oh, I think That's, I want to see them all 36 colors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's actually 72 distress colors, so we could even have 72 of them, Mario. So careful, careful what, <laughs> careful what you wish for. He was like, oh, 36. I'm like, I think we may have done 36. That's bundled sage. Isn't that great? This is salvage patina. I mean, look, they are so beautiful. They are. So this one is a favorite. This is the first one I tried this on. This is speckled egg. Um, so if you want like a really beautiful, soft, wintry, speckled egg is like the, I don't know, the lost shadow of blues because it's really, really faint. Super stunning. And here's what you're going to notice about sparkle as we go through it. The color of glitter that I wanted in this paste is a, it's a platinum-ish color. So if, if you're familiar with platinum, platinum is that like sometimes it looks very silver and sometimes it looks a little bit more gold, okay? So when it comes to using it, like for example, on this one, the glitter appears to be more silvery because it's with the blue. But then if you got into, I can go back to some of the warmer colors, that glitter appears to be more gold. So it's kind of a chameleon-y glitter because I just wanted one product. It was like, oh, you, you want to do sparkle in this color and this color? We could do a red sparkle and a green. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, I don't, I'm just not that person. I like to have like a medium and use what I have to color it because I don't always want a jar of, of red or this. It, it depends on, on my make. So I like the fact that I can just, you know, mix up a, a small batch. Look at tumbled glass. That's also really pretty. I love that. You can do evergreen bough or peacock feathers or I mean you'll see these colors are magic and this could be used oh look at that one yeah that's peacock feathers this could be used year round for all types of different things if you're doing water if you're doing sky ocean oh look at this one this is yeah this color this is uncharted mariner so you can also see that when you mix a translucent paste the thicker it is the more intense the color is and the thinner it is the lighter it is. So if you were doing, let's say, a, a sky or you just wanted to cover some paper and you could die cut this. So you could do this on a piece of paper and then run it through a die or you can apply it after uh, to your die cuts. You can apply it with a paintbrush. You can apply it with a palette knife. You'll see in the demo uh, different ways to apply it. I do love this one. Beautiful. That's the color that drives everyone crazy. Shaded lilac. It's just a good one. Seedless preserves. I mean, Come on, look at that seedless preserves. Well, I wanted black hair cobbler Very good. last night after I did that. Yeah, it, it, that should have been called cobbler, right? Seedless preserves are probably close. Wilted violet, really nice purple. Again, Halloween. Antique linen. So just adding a little subtle shimmer onto things. Maybe they're going to go on flowers, paper flowers, die, whatever that is. Unbelievable. Then, of course, we get into the, the grunge because grunge and glitter, well, that, that is a match made in, in Tim Holtz Creative Heaven. This one, this is frayed burlap. So look at that. Look at that sparkle in frayed burlap, my gosh. Uh, vintage photo, so we get that beautiful uh, sepia color from vintage photo. There's walnut stain under here, because even, uh, see, even the darkest of that could be really good. See, just that sparkle is so, that's what's great about it. I mean, I thought the name sparkle, was, I, that's just what it does, because when you look at it, depending on how the light hits it, it doesn't, it's not like a glitter paste, it's just that. Um, this one right here, that's a little bit of lost shadow. Again, that really faint gray, then black, because for Halloween, why not have a black glittery paste? And you can see it, it's almost like obsidian, right? Look at how, how that black sparkles. So all of that from this one paint, just plain and a little bit of ink. And I'll show you how to, how to do that. So whether you're doing Halloween or Christmas, you can make up a batch of this with ease. Here's how easy it is to do. So you're going to work with a, a water-based reinker. I'm going to use distress reinkers, but you can use what you want, but make sure that it's a dye reinker and it's water-based because if it's pigment, it's going to cover up everything. That's why you can't do this with paint or anything like that. You need it to be ink. Uh, can you use a spray stain? I wouldn't recommend a spray because the spray has too much water in it and that's going to turn this paste into something very slimy and gooey. 
Reinkers are concentrated. The reinker for a stamp pad, it's a concentrated form of ink that goes in a stamp pad. So that is why I use what I use. But if you want to try something else, you do you. But if it's not working, just come back and watch this part where I talk specifically about a reinker because of its uh, color intensity. You don't have to use a lot and its consistency. I'm just going to do a quick swatch on uh, watercolor paper. Let me grab a palette knife. I can take one out of here. There we go. Just a palette knife to mix. Um, I like to just mix on these little uh, deli papers. Paula told me about this. You could mix directly on here. Uh, you can work on your media mat or a craft sheet or whatever, but yeah, get yourself some, so just some dry wax paper or anything because you can mix it quick and then, you know, you can fold it and use another piece, but it is pretty, it can get pretty messy and you have to clean up glitter. So it's, glitter's not going to float everywhere, but it's going to, I mean, that's, that's the thing to remember. All right. What color do we want to make? Let's do, I'll just do salvage patina just because I really like that color. So we're going to take that reinker, and here's how easy it is to mix. You can mix as much or as little as you want, depending on your card. I'm just going to do, I'll just say a palette knife of it like that. I wouldn't mix any less than that, but you can certainly mix more than that. And it also depends on how intense you want your color. Obviously the more uh, paste to ink ratio, the more saturated or non-saturated your color is going to be. Okay. So we're going to unscrew this. These come in a dropper. So it's going to be one drop of ink. So one little dot, see that? So not a dropper, but one, one dot of ink. Um, if that's too much for what you're making, you can try to do a half a drop, you know, by dragging, you know, maybe just drag your dropper onto the wax paper, whatever. Then you're going to take your palette knife and you could, you can stir it if you want. I just kind of fold it into itself. There's that finger. Do you see that finger hanging out? I told you it just does that. Um, but what I'm trying to do is I just want to mix it so I don't have any striations of color. If you, maybe you want that though, maybe you want it to kind of be marbly. That could be cool too. And that's it. It's mixed. It's that quick. It mixes up really quick because it's water based to water base. So when you use the right colorants for your mediums, you shouldn't have any struggle mixing it up. Then we can just take this and spread it out. So this is what I'm going to talk about how this goes onto a surface. So when you spread it onto a surface with your palette knife, if you skim it really thin like that, that's what's going to give you more of that uh, translucent look, right? That thinner part here. If you leave it built up, that's going to create more intense color. So depending on how you want this to be, if, if you wanted this to be say all over thin, you can use a palette knife. You can use a paintbrush. I think a palette knife is nice because you're not going to get uh, brush strokes in it, but see, you can apply it super thin. And if you had a, a longer palette knife, I would use, these are both distressed palette knives, but, you can use whatever palette knife you want. I just like these because they have a little, a little give, a little bend, but they're not metal. So this one, of course, will, I can just scoop some off of this. Why not? Just do this in the air. Normally I would just do this on the table, but you can see that something like this really allows you to, to just spread it out as thin as you want this to be. Okay. But you have to work quickly because you can see already, you see those lines. This is already starting to dry because it's so thin. And as it dries, if you start going through it, you'll start getting more texture. So if you want more texture, that's another idea that you can kind of, uh, maybe if you're going for a little bit more of an icy texture, see that? Let it dry for a couple seconds and then go in a different direction because all of that will still dry in a texture and you're going to get different depths of color simply because it is a translucent dye. Super, super simple and easy to do. Cleanup, as long as it's wet, water-based cleanup. So I, I've got just a, a little container of water off to the side. So I can just dip my palette knife in water and just clean that off. That's the easiest thing to do is if you have a water-based medium, anything, clean it while it's wet, it just makes it super fast. And then for this, you can mix another blue on here. If you're going to switch colors, we normally just fold that up until all surfaces are, are covered. Um, Cheryl asks, can you die cut through the paste? Yes, I mentioned already, you can die cut through this paste. This paste is flexible. So when I talked about die cutting, you can die cut through it or apply it to something already die cut because it is flexible. So yeah, just like all your paste, but see how, see how different that is. We'll let these dry. We'll see if they dry. Um, I don't like to force this one. Anytime I have a translucent gloss, I don't like to use a heat tool because it will bubble and I don't want that to happen. So I'll set these aside and we'll see how they dry up as we get through it. Really good. Nice. Okay. So there we go. That's how easy it is to tint. And it was the same thing uh, that we did for, the snowfall as we did for sparkle water-based reinker little distress so if you 
if you have your distress reinkers, it's really, really good. Um, uh, Deanne, what if you used archival? Archival is not water-based, so archival ink is oil-based. So if you try to use archival, you might get a little separation, but try it. Like I said, I, I prefer water-based, but if you try it with our archival ink, it, it may mix, but it probably is going to have a little striation because archival isn't water-based. It is oil-based, and oil and water usually don't mix. Okay, so when it comes to this paste, here was really the, the reason. The, the tinting part was <laughs> what Mario and I did last night when I was like, oh, I want to see if this, you know, how this colors. Like, and once, of course, I started with speckled egg, I'm like, we're going, going, going. But here was really um, the main reason for wanting a translucent, sparkly paste and go on it. Could you color by smudging ink on the glass? Yes, because your re-inker is the same as your ink pad. So yes, you can smudge your distress ink and off you go. All right. So Mario, can you turn down that light outside just a bit? I see like my hands igniting on the light. Just thank you. Okay. So the, the biggest thing about sparkle and what I love about it, it's probably just because there's so much white in here, um, is that you can use this paste with the things that we have. That's great. Thanks, Mario. And what that would be, would be our inks. Now, this one you could use with ink or oxide or archival, and I'll explain why, because we're not really coloring this, all right? So this right here is a stenciled little sparkly tree. There you go. You can see that glitter in there. This one stencil little sparkly snowflakes Sweet. and then this one stencil sparkly poinsettias so hopefully just me showing this is kind of telling you how it was done it was done different these are not done using a color version of sparkle these are done just using the paste out of the jar that was the inspiration could you mix it? Like if you wanted all green trees, could you mix up a batch and just go through? Yes, we've already talked about how that could be done. But what I love about this is that we can create all of these beautiful blended backgrounds and then add sparkle. So here we go. We're gonna start with, I'm just gonna take a piece of media grip just because I wanna work with uh, a stencil. So I'll take a little bit of media grip and I'm just gonna place that down. That's gonna add some grip for my paper and my and my stencil you can do this on any kind of paper that you want i'm going to just use the back of watercolor paper just like i did here and then we're going to take some type of blending tool it could be a blending brush whatever whatever you like and i'll i can do the the poinsettias i can replicate that all right so you can take whatever ink now the reason you can use whatever ink is because we are applying the paste over the ink not mixing it. So that's why it doesn't matter if you did oxide, if you did whatever. I would say that I still prefer it with a dye ink because any ink that you use underneath it, like an oxide, that oxide is going to re-wet and it's going to make this cloudy. It'll still sparkle, but not as much as if you used a, a dye ink. So could you use archival for this? Yes, but archival doesn't blend very well. So again, I know it's like a million other questions than, than the ink that I suggest, but I would suggest something you can blend with in order to get a blended look with the paste. Okay, so let's get a stencil and I'll take a little one. I think that's this one. I have a lot of Christmas stencils. This is where it's fun. Like most of the time, my stencils are all just put on a ring in numerical order, but I talk about this when you get the making season. My advice as a maker, when you go in and you start your making season is go through your stuff and gather the stuff for the season and and put it somewhere, you know, where if, if you have a bazillion stencils, I have so many rings and rings of stencils, you know, like a ton. I have like, I have four of these and they're all different and I have minis, but I have now a ring for Christmas and I have a ring for Halloween because for the making season, I don't want to have to go through hundreds of stencils to find what I want. Same thing for stamps or dies. You just kind of create a, a making space for the season. So I'm going to take this stencil and we'll take this out pop that off. And I just wanted to show because yes, if you're like, Hey, I just want to go for it and just do the blue. But if you notice these snowflakes are not all the way blue from end to end, they kind of fade in and out blue and clear because I did this technique. I did the ink and then just regular sparkle paste over the top. Okay. So what we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to start by inking 
our background. So I'm just going to place a stencil down. I'll take a little bit. There we go. You can see that. That's good. Take just a little bit of tape. I always like to create a hinge because I just prefer, I prefer to be able to like look and, and release, but I've got grip under there and that's going to help with the stencil uh, and the paper. I'm going to use a distress blending brush, but again, you can use whatever uh, you want. I'll take some colors. I think I'll use just a little kitsch flamingo, maybe on this one. Um, I think I'll do, I'll do a little red, a little barn door, maybe some aged mahogany. That will be some reds. Then we'll use some greens. I think I want to do a little, we'll do some twisted citron and there's no way I can open this and not take peeled paint because it would be really crabby with me. Okay. So I'll take a brush. Now, if you have other brushes, you can use whatever brush you want to work with. That's totally, totally fine. I got to see the last color I used on this may not be pink. So I'm, I know I'm going to start with a light color. So I just want to make sure that I, I clean the brush. And just wipe it off on a paper towel or it could be a scrap piece of paper whatever you prefer okay so i'll start with a, a light color we're just going to go with pink and you can again use your regular ink pads you don't need a lot of ink for this so i'm just going to pick up some color i have the brush retracted all the way back so the bristles fan out this is what's going to give me um, a little bit more if you want to use your blending tool because i have my blending foams that's fine but something detailed i definitely prefer a brush so i'll just start by just going in that kind of wispy motion because i'm applying my lightest color i want it to be open and wispy well you'll see how we how we can build color with with the distress brushes that's why i like working with these brushes so you can see it's very very wispy right now see how it fades out that could be done you could be happy with that um but i like the wispiness then on some maybe i want it to be uh, a little red. I see a question about the rings. Those rings are from Stampers Anonymous. They're the, the wire stencil rings. They're, I need like another 25 of them. They're very good because uh, I use them for many things. That's what I use. I'll put them on for my swatches and everything because it's got a little thing that you can unscrew and then that, the book ring doesn't pop open. Those drive me crazy. All right, so now I've got red. Now red, as you can see, I don't want it to be uh, as wispy. So the nice thing about this brush is I can slide this collar up and then that makes the brushes more compact and that provides more detail blending, if you will. So with the same brush, and, and all I'm doing is I'm holding my finger like right under that ring so it doesn't retract. It just holds it exactly where I want it to be. And now I'll go into some other flowers and just add more of a, a concentrated color of red. I won't do it to all of them because some of them I want more pinky and some I want more red. And then we'll do the same thing. We're going to go down to uh, Age Mahogany, pick up that. Same thing. I'm going to slide this up. Just use my, just use my finger. And then I'll just, this is going to be more of a, I guess, a stippling, if you will. A little dabity dab. Because that I just want, I think I'll put a little bit of red up here. Okay. So far, so good. And you can do all of it if you want. It's completely up to you how much inking and how involved you want to get with your inking. Uh, you do what works. So I'm going to slide this all the way up. So you got those little bumps there and then close and then it just stays together. This is just colored with a Sharpie. I just use a Sharpie to go around the edge. Next, we're going to do some green because I want to do the, the holly leaves. Now, I don't wipe my stencil in between. I just, I don't clean it until the end until I have to. So I'm going to start again with a light color. I don't mind what color green was on here because to me, the greens are gonna blend great. Um, whoop, because the holly leaves are so small, I'm gonna start probably midway. I don't want it that big as the flowers, but I also don't want it too concentrated. So I'm gonna kind of go in the middle. I, it, it's what I love about these brushes. It, it does give me a little bit more creative flexibility. Some people, they don't like that. You know, They want a tiny brush for tiny things and a medium brush, and that's great. You have to do what as a maker, what you're comfortable using. So there we can see, you see when I lift it up, see that it's kind of all nice and faded and blended. If I wanna go a little darker, which I do, I'm gonna take a little peeled paint, same brush. I almost lost that cap, went rolling, all right. This time I am gonna slide this up because I want a little bit, a little darker concentration on a couple of these leaves. And then this is more of that stipple kind of pouncing because if you see the brush, bristles, they kind of have a little dome, like a old school stencil brush, if you remember those with the, with the wooden handle at the end of it. All right, nice. Okay, then when I'm done, slide that up just to 
protect the bristles and lock and go. So we're going to do the inside for the yellow. Hey, there you go. There's your Hey Mario. Hey Mario, uh, can you grab me just a, can you grab me a cotton swab right from the, there you go. So here's the thing. If you're ever doing small little details, um, if you got a, a Q-tip or cotton swab or anything, you're just going to take that. That's, that's going to be your cheat for the inside. I'll take a, a little bit of, uh, maybe I want to do fossilized amber as the yellow. So you can see the center of the flowers. So I'm just going to dip a little ink and then I'm just going to press right in the middle of these. And that's just the easiest way to add a little bit of color. You could probably use a brush or many other things, but I think that this, it likes to absorb ink and it also keeps that little, that little pouncy point. You'll see when I lift this off what I'm talking about, but you can't lift this off until you are done, done. So I can't do any up close and personals right now to show you because we're not done. Okay, so I just took that. That's trash, you can still use the other side, but easy way to put the, that little bit of yellow in the center with ease, okay? So let's close these up. We're done with the, the inking part. Pretty, that was pretty easy, wasn't it? And this is one of those also that you could do all of your inking uh, ahead of time. If you were working on a bigger piece, you could certainly do that. Uh, I just find it easier if I do one at a time because I don't have to worry about lining it up but you still can. Now we have ink on our stencil. If I lift this up, you can see hmm, there's ink on the stencil. Ideally, I don't want that ink on there because if I take my paste and start applying it, the paste is gonna grab this color and move it. So that means that green is gonna go into the paint. It's just gonna start making uh, a muddy mess. Could you, could you lift this off and do all that? Yes, you, can, you have a lot of options. Uh, an easy cheat if you will, because my, my paper is on the grip, is I can just lift up the hinge, I can place that down, I can take a cloth or, or whatever, and just, just wipe this off. I don't have to be too particular, I don't have to use a baby wipe in water, um, just something that I can easily wipe off. Just to, just to, take, off, just to take off the excess, okay, then I can, lift up that hinge, I can remove that paper, and we're lined up, okay? So, pretty clever, huh? Every time well, I learn something from you. Well, you know. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna add our layer of sparkle. And the sparkle is just, it's the magic part, okay? And because it's clear, let's say you wanted to do your inking, okay, let's just say you did your inking, and you're like, oh, uh, now I need to kind of lay it down and position it. You you can still line these up really easy, okay? Just make sure that when you're placing this down, it's about the cleaner stencil more than lined up because this is ultimately a clear paste. So if you have a little bit on over something, it's not really gonna matter, but just try to have it lined up as possible. Now, because this is a glitter that's kind of floating around, once you introduce a stencil, you have to be aware of the properties of this paste, meaning the glitter particles are gonna catch onto things. So when I'm applying paste, I wanna use a palette knife. I don't wanna use a squeegee because a squeegee is gonna force your glitter pretty much to the bottom section uh, of your stencil. So what I mean is I just wanna go in and skim over this and try to, try to do each one like one layer, if you will. Because the more you work this paste over and over, especially with a squeegee, the more you have to worry about building up glitter in a certain section of a stencil. It's not, a, it's not the end of the world. It's not like coin dozer where you're gonna have a ton of glitter in one spot, right? Where it's just gonna push it all, okay? There you go. Because we cleaned off the ink from our stencil, we didn't waste any of our paste. This isn't contaminated. It can go right back into the jar. I'll put the lid on this. This again, water base, so just clean it with water. I'm just gonna dry it off with my towel. There we go. And then your paste, you can either lift with your finger or you can lift with your palette knife. There, there's our hinge. So now we can just peel this off. To clean it off of your stencil, same thing, water. While it's wet, you can just place it in a container of water or you can go and wipe it off. And then we have this, this is what we have. So this paste goes on kind of a milky white. Don't be concerned, it's going to dry crystal clear. So everything's gonna look like, oh, I don't see anything. And you're not gonna see any sparkle until it dries. So you might think, oh, wait a minute, uh, I don't have any glitter because I don't see any. Well, you won't. The sparkle happens when it dries, when that, 
paste goes from an opaque to a translucent, you will end up with this effect. And again, if it dries by the end of the live, we'll see it. But that's, that is the look that we get. All those little sparkly little pieces. So that's, that's good. So I'm gonna get this out of the way so I don't, I don't get my finger in it. Now to clean this off of your grip, same, the nice thing about grip, of course, you can just throw it in the sink, but you can also just clean this off. So as long as the medium's wet, it's super easy to clean off. If it's dry, you can use media grip and just go in and wash it. And this has already been cut because media grip, you can use either side of it. Um, you just use it again and again. It's one of my, one of my go-tos now. I just use it all the time. So that really is the benefit of sparkle. The fact that we can color it, we can make it, you know, a, a bazillion colors ahead of time. If you wanted to do something easy like trees, maybe you're doing, you know, backgrounds for snowflakes and you're like, I am not going to ink and then go back and paste. I just want to do like light blue snowflakes. Okay, well then mix up a batch of whatever color and, and do that. But I also love the fact that if you're going to do this, like it's besides the sparkle, it's that gloss, it's that shine. It's like a dimensional glossy accents with that yeah, see, there you go. I think I'm, I'm going slow enough that you can see just how well it sparkles. Whenever I get close to the camera, I think YouTube gets a little, little glitchy and gets nervous. Okay, so, so far so good. We've only done just sparkle. It's a lot of stuff we can talk about. Okay, moving on. Oh, look how these are drying. Ooh, this is almost dry. Take a look at that. See, look at that icy one, I told you. Look how nice that is. Sparkle, really. It's so good. Come on. It's just so good. Okay. Um, beautiful, beautiful. So next we're going to just talk about the colors. I, I can still talk about sparkle. Uh, you know what, guys, I can't not talk about sparkle. I'll talk about sparkle and then we'll get into the colors. Just because honestly, once you start with this, it takes you just on a, you can't, stop. You can't. You my can't. gosh. I, okay. So the thing about sparkle is that it goes beyond the paste. And I think it's important to talk about that because as makers, we understand a medium and then we think that that's how it needs to be used. And I think in our world, we hear the word paste or read the word paste. And we think it's always a stencil. It's always textured. It's always thick. And that's not always the case, especially with this sparkle paste because of that translucent base and how we can build up layers. And I think that's, that was the whole point of this demo. Is so you understand its properties and how you have the ability to apply it. You can take any of your paper things that you have. So maybe it's going to be, you know, printed paper. These are backdrops, but it could be your scrapbook paper or cardstock, or maybe it's going to be your ephemera, or maybe it's even going to be coated things like layers. You can do this on, on a lot of things. But the beauty of this is that we can go in, I'll just start with, with paper get this little container out. So you could take a piece of paper like this is just a normal backdrop. Okay. There's nothing sparkly. So you're like, I don't see it good because it's not there, but you can apply it directly to paper. And then that paper becomes sparkly. I don't know if you can see that little bit of sparkle. There we go. You can see it in the paper. And this was inspired by Paula. Paula is making for Christmas right now. And she's like, Oh my gosh, I just painted the sparkle paste on cardstock. And it's like, it's magic. I'm like, really? And she goes, yeah, it's just, you just paint it on. So I'm going to show you, you just paint it on with a brush, but you can see those little kind of flecks in there, but gosh, trying to get this glitter. There we go. It just sparkles and you can do this really on anything there. Again, that's just regular back backdrop. And this is backdrop where you've got the sparkles and the sparkles are very, besides you have shiny paper, look in those holly leaves. That's where you can really see it right now on the camera. It just has this subtlety. It's not glitter paper and it's still totally flexible, pliable, good. Okay. Ephemera, same thing. You can, you can brush it onto ephemera. Look at that. See just that little bit of shine and sparkle and it goes right into the paper. If it's an uncoated paper, it will go right into the paper. It still leaves a little bit of a shine. Okay. But if you put it on, something shiny, shiny on shiny, you'll get brush strokes, which I don't mind, but you can see like on the point, I don't know if uh, now I'm trying to show you brush strokes, but yes, you can get brush strokes. I saw a question, does it resist? Absolutely. When it dries, it will resist. It will resist water-based mediums. So it'll resist watercolor or, or stains or wet distressing. But yes, it dries to a, a resist finish. Look at that. 
I uh, see. I love the brush strokes, but that's because it's shiny on shiny. It couldn't absorb and it, it really is easy. I'll just show you on a, a piece of paper. Um, what you're going to want is, you know, when you work with this, I just work here. It was easier for me, but if you wanted to work on, you know, deli paper or whatever you can, the thing to remember is get yourself like a brush. That's going to be big enough for what you want to do, but also soft enough where you're not dragging through it. Okay. So like a distress collage medium brush would have too much texture, but maybe you want it to be textured. Could you do this with a palette knife? Uh, you could try, but it's, it's going to look, it's going to look like this. It's going to look like you used a palette knife. So if you want it to go on really thin, just, just work with a paintbrush. It's very easy to paint on. And we're just going to take some of that and you'll see just how, how quick that is. Just want to make sure look over there. I'm in frame. Okay. Take the paste and you start brushing it on and you just keep going back and forth back and forth and you'll feel it just start gripping the bristles. Like you'll kind of feel a little bit of drag and you're done. Like that's how, that's how quick it is. And it will dry completely clear. And when it dries, you see the sparkle. That's the other thing you have to remember. Um, I can hold it in front of a, a fan probably for a second or so. Um, you could dry this with a heat tool on paper. I wouldn't recommend drying it with a heat tool on something uh, thicker. I would just kind of let it dry, but something this thin, I don't know if the sparkle is showing up yet. Uh, probably not yet, but you'll see it when it dries because of that translucent base. And I love just seeing those little, just those little sparkles. It's so random and so vintage and so good. And because it is a paste, because it's a thicker viscosity, it doesn't have a lot of moisture in it. So it doesn't make your paper ripple like lasagna. Brush cleanup is the same cleanup as the palette knife, the stencil, the surface, the everything else water, water-based cleanup, just as long as it's wet, you can do that. So that was, I mean, that's it. It's an easy one, uh, but it's something that maybe you really wouldn't think of. And I didn't think of it. And when Paul's like, you just paint it on, like, now that's a really good idea because, you know, uh, I've done this before with like resist spray and a glitter duster, but you still get a huge concentration of glitter. But because that glitter is just, it's just random. Then you get that beautiful sparkly cardstock and still paper. I mean, you can do, so you can do all your folding and cutting and everything else that you want to do. If you were going to stamp on top of this, then I would stamp with archival because technically you have sealed this paper. Uh, but if you stamped first, I would, I would still stamp with archival because anything else would smear from the paste. So there you are. Nice, fun, all the things to do with paste. Okay. Now as promised, we're going to get into the colors. So, so good. It's like, my gosh, you just want, you want all the stuff. I want all the stuff. Okay. Um, to do a little bit of prep, let's see, what do I have here? Okay. I'm going to take this. I have so much stuff on the table, guys. You have no idea. It's, <laughs> you do have a lot of it's crazy because it's like too many ideas. Okay. I'm going to put some, I'm going to put some texture paste just on a couple of tags so we can come back and spray them uh, later. So I've got, I've got my paste also nice that now I can have two tins of paste. This is the distress ink pad storage tin that I took out the insert and it fits eight jars of paste and that everybody has their own storage preference. It's not meant for that because you have all that height, but you can see, I put my palette knives. I put the, you know, these, these are great little rubber squeegees for stencil. I've got all my press and seal on there. Okay. But it's nice that, you know, these two new, uh, I can put in there. I'm hoping that, you know, sparkle and black stay, stay around long after the season. I know people ask the so same thing. Else. Yeah, I really, I do. I hope that sparkle, I, I would love it if sparkle became an everyday paste and same with black opaque for those that haven't used it. It's, it's a good one. Okay. I'm going to take, let's see, I'll take a couple of stencils. I'm flipping through real quick. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, okay. I'll just do these. And I'm just going to apply some, this is opaque texture paste. So this is a texture paste that is designed to absorb color. So I want this so we can spray them with mica stain and it can absorb some color. So I've got my press and seal over the top. I'm just going to peel that. And it, it's important that if you're going to use press and seal, you press and seal. It doesn't go just over the top. It, you press it into your medium. So there is no uh, air in between uh, the paste and, and what you have on there. Okay. So same thing, I'm just going to use a piece of media grip really quick. Probably want something a little bit bigger for this. So I got a bigger piece of grip. All right, because I'm doing a tag, I've got, there you go. 
bigger piece. This way it'll it'll grip the the tag and the stencil a little bit better. Because when I'm using paste like with a stencil, I don't necessarily um, tape it down. Just because once you put paste, you place this down, you just kind of push it down. It it seems to hold pretty well. So I'm just scooping up some of this paste. I'm going to go pretty pretty random, meaning I I don't. Some people want their entire thing done. So could you use a squeegee for this? Yes, but because I just want it to be random, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. So what I'm doing is I'm pressing down to apply the paste and I'm skimming off with the edge. So when you see all those movements, that's really what I'm doing. It's like pressing and skimming because a, a good rule to follow when using texture paste is you want to be able to see the, the design. I can lift this up. See how I can see the design even though I have paste? If you can't see your design, you have too much paste. And then when you lift your stencil, your paste will collapse and it will look really messy. So, you, you know, you don't need to go and scrape every little bit off. You see how there's extra there? I don't go in and scrape it out because I still want some texture, some different highs and lows, but that's it. And then we just peel that off. There we go. We're going to let that dry. This is going to go in the water. Pretty simple. I'll set that off and we'll do another one. So same thing, place it down. I can just wipe off that paste from the grip with ease. So this one, I just have it a little bit, a little bit bigger, a little hair there. There we go. Oh, grips everything. There we are. Take a little bit of paste. And this one, I want, I want that Mary to be there. And let's start at the top. There we go. Again, you just use the parts and pieces that you like. So spread, squeegee, spread, squeegee and kind of follow the design of your stencil as well. So I can see that my text is linear. So I'm trying to kind of go across just to, to get it into those letters. And I just, again, I like the, the haphazardness of it all. That can go back in the jar, scrape that off. Same thing, water. If you just have a little tray of water, it's easy. You just clean and wipe and you're ready to go. This we press and seal. And then the lid goes on. This will just keep your mediums to last a little bit longer. Still not an everlasting gobstopper, but it lasts longer. Okay. I use my palette knife to just kind of pick that up. Stencil in the water. And there we go. So see, I love all that just random textury bits. Good. So we're going to let those dry. Set those aside to dry. Thanks, Mario. You're welcome. All right. And then this same thing. Just gonna quickly clean that up. And I'll place that back. So I just store my, I store my media grip in these little, these are from Simon Says Stamp. They're, they're like paper protectors, but I've cut off the, they're like pockets. So they're normally sealed, but I've, I've just cut the edges so I can just peel this back and take it. Cause you can't, you can't put grip into a pocket, but if you have media grip, you wanna store it to where it doesn't have any, <laughs> It doesn't have any exposure to the elements because dust and everything will stick to your grip. You can still clean it indefinitely, but um, that's just how you want to store it. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to have those set off to the side. So here we go. As promised, let's get into the colors. It's like enough already. I've been dragging this on. So the whole idea now in the world of Distress Mica Stain is that we have a palette, a full palette of 36 colors. And this is, this has really been the plan. As I mentioned, the plan was 24, but that's 36. This, these are stored in the multi storage tin. This is the same tin that is for uh, reinkers and paint. It wasn't really designed for these mini sprays, but it works. I will tell you though, if you're going to use it for the mini stains, this, this size bottle, which uh, dilutions comes in this as well. You have to just kind of, as you open it, just lift this out with your finger for a second. And yeah, I've had a couple people go, well, that's ridiculous. I'm like, if it's that ridiculous, just don't use it for your sprays. But I'm happy that I can put my sprays. So I have all of my mica stains in here. And then these three um, are just the actual mica sprays. These are, these are part of the everyday line. So these are just mica with no color, but I like that I can now put them in and there's just a, a little space just because they, they don't want to, they don't want to sit together. I'm okay with that. Maybe I'll put a little water in there for travel. Um, but what's nice about having these uh, in a tin is that I can see the colors. Now the colors have been labeled, they've been indexed. And I know we've, I think maybe we did this on Instagram or I don't really remember where. I'm gonna have just them kind of sitting off to the side because they'll drive me crazy otherwise. Um, but Ranger sells swatch labels. They have 
label sheets on their site. And retailers might have these by now as well. But what these are and what makes them so significant, because some people might just be rolling their eyes going, oh, label sheets, is it's the same sticker paper that's used on the product. So if you've ever tried to use like office supply labels, especially on a clear lid, they peel off. Or when you try to label bottles, it peels off because those are really labels meant for paper. This label stock is this stock. It's just, just already die cut and plain. So you can go in and add your ink. You can use markers. You can use whatever product you want to create your labels. And they come in three different sizes. The small ones, of course, those go on any of your spray tops. These big ones can go on your paint jars. They can also go on ink bottles. And then these fit your ink pads. So you can, we've, I think we used a gel plate when we did ours, but you can, you know, just ink them and peel it off and they'll stick to the outside of your, of your ink pad. So that's how we've, that's how we've done ours. So these are the actual color. You can see that we just took a little paintbrush and kind of dipped in and, and used that to color it. But what's great about this is that now that we have the palette, we're really going to explore what this palette is. That's what I said. Today's demo is about the products themselves. We'll get into the Christmas makes the rest of the month. Um, but this is about what makes these mica stains so cool to have in your everyday work. The Christmas just finished the palette. This is really the palette. So when you look at this palette, you're like, that's not Halloween or Christmas. Nope. Although those sets came out during those seasons, and they were seasonal colors between the two seasons. It's really nice that I was able to develop a full palette. And I have to say, I'm really happy that it's a palette of 36 because it looks very, very complete. I absolutely love it. So these, you can see, these are all the mica stains. So they have that beautiful colorant with that shimmer. Now, instead of a spray, and I've talked about this too, but I'm going to demo it here because this is like the, this is the complete wrap up of, of mica. There's a lot of things that we can do with these. So a mica stain isn't a spray. It does have a mica that settles at the bottom. And you'll see when I go to actually demo the sprays, you know, I'll have mine laid down because it makes it quicker. When you go to use it, you want to shake it side to side to try to get that, that metal mixing ball to break up that mica. You can shake it upside down, uh, up and down, but just remember that if you do that, sometimes you'll get a little bit of ink that seeps out of the little schnozzle here for the sprayer. Uh, just because of the pressure that you're building up in the bottle. So if you find that happening, especially happens in high altitude areas, we live up in the mountains, so high altitude. Um, if that drives you crazy, you can take off the lid, you can cover it with a paper towel and then shake it. It is faster to shake that way, but if you don't wanna deal with it, just kind of ring it like a bell and then that'll still mix it up. But you're gonna see me just shake it like that because like, I don't care if I have ink everywhere, I'm just gonna end up using it, okay? So sprays, are designed for sprays, but there are many ways that you can decant and use this product. And we talked about this last year and Ranger uh, was gracious enough to launch uh, like an accessory for the product that they don't normally do it. I wanted a way that I could take my sprays and use them other ways. In addition to the spray, I just felt that you would get more mileage instead of, instead of saying, oh, well you have this product and this product, even though it's all the same, I'm, I'm not that guy. I want it to be like, okay, there's this product, but Maybe I don't want to spray it. I want it in a bottle, but I don't want to release another ink in a bottle. Just sell the bottles. So these bottles, these are the alcohol ink bottles. So they're like a high density bottle, the little plastic nib, the cap and the mixing balls, a little stainless steel mixing ball. Um, you can purchase these again, Ranger has them, but I think there's a lot of retailers. Simon says stamp might even have brought them in. So you, Oh, cool. So you can buy the bottles. You can also buy replacement sprayers. You can buy spray bottles. There's a lot of things that you can do. These, I just want to show you because I don't think people believe me. I think they're like, oh, you're Tim Holtz. You have a case of sprayers. You don't care if it clogs. Yeah, I care if it clogs. So if we have a, a spray that clogs, okay, that's just because you didn't shake this enough. And that's not intentional, but you know, maybe you're in a hurry to use it and you go to ink it and you suck up some of that mica, that powder is gonna clog this little tube and you're not gonna get a spray. Just unscrew the cap, soak it in water, usually warm water, and start spraying it through the water to get it to unclog. Because I'm an impatient maker, if, if something clogs, I'm just gonna unscrew that, take that thing off, throw it in water, and then put in a new one. So you can buy a replacement pack, but I don't throw away the one that I cleaned so you can see these are all stained. Once it's cleaned, it just kind of goes in. So I think I only ended up with maybe two replacement packs that I've purchased. Everything else is just, you just kind of do a rotation. 
So it is good to have a little stash because if you're in the creative flow and you really, really want to use a color, I'm not going to go in and, and clean it. I'm going to get so frustrated and then I'll end up just doing this to, to where you're probably never going to be able to clean it out because if you continue to pack it with mica, it won't clean. So those are the sprayers that I have. You can also buy these. Uh, Ranger sells these. These are called pipettes. They're disposable. They're little droppers, but this is a way that you can drip the ink on if you're into a mixed, mixed media environment. But I'm going to talk about how we uh, put the inks in these little bottles. So I do have a whole little set of mica stains in these bottles. This is the alcohol storage tin. It fits all of them except six colors. So it doesn't really fit all of them. It fits 30, let's just say. So if you're gonna make all of them, um, you're gonna have six that don't fit. For me, they're all my neutrals and I'm perfectly happy because I have these at my desk. So maybe you don't have to make all 36 colors, but I have my neutral ones. So the one I have not made is frozen fog. So that's what we're gonna make because I want to. All right, so here's how you create this. So what's nice about this is now I've got the same mica stain that I would spray, but now I have it in a bottle that I can paint with. I can paint with and color. If you're not gonna do this a lot, I have some tips for you because I don't want you just to go buy the bottles and make them just so you can say, ooh, now I have them in both. If you are never gonna use it this way, do not spend your money or your time to make these. But if you are a painter and you find that you do a lot more coloring than you do backgrounds, it would be advantageous to to make these, um, but I still like having the options. So how you do it is quite simple. You're gonna need the bottle, you're gonna need the nib, you're gonna need the cap, and you need that little mixing ball. And when you, when you get these, all that stuff comes together. You don't have to buy those components separate. Then we're going to take our mica stain, and you can see all the mica is down there. We have to mix this up. We have to make sure that mixing ball is going. If you're gonna go into spray mode, I would recommend having these all lay on their sides. If you're going to be, let's say you know you're gonna be making, you can take your tin and you can lay them on their side the day you're making. I wouldn't recommend storing them that way. It's a liquid, it's, it's still anything can happen. But like if I know I'm gonna spray for the day, I'll lay these down for maybe the first 15 minutes and then take them all out of the tin, okay? Because that mica is much better if all your bottles lay on the side. So I'm just telling you that because when you see me demo, I don't demo from the tin. I store them in the tin, but when I use them, they're all over the place. They're rolling everywhere. In fact, I'm gonna do that now. So while I'm doing this, these will have time to just do their thing, okay? Um, I like to just lay them down. They're gonna be everywhere. You might hit, you might hear a few hit the floor. It is what it is. Am I gonna take out all the colors? I am, because whatever I don't take out, I'm gonna wish I did. So I've got them all around all the way around off of the mat. There we go, there we go. Ooh, that almost went. Almost. Almost. I need a little fallen acorn too. There we go. Okay. Happy, happy, happy. Um, the tins, just like the, the distressed ones, they stack, so I like that I can have all of my sprays, all of your sprays, two tins ready to go. So here's how we're going to decant it. Okay, we're gonna take this, we're gonna mix it up. Shakety shake. Look at that, see? Doesn't take long for that to mix up. That's the purpose of the ball. There we go. So I don't see any sludge down there. So then just have some sort of, you're gonna need some sort of towel or something that you're gonna want for the side because when you take out uh, the sprayer, it's got this schnozzle that's bent by design. It just, this way you get all the liquid so don't, don't go and cut it, it's just gonna be there. Then you're just going to take this and we're going to pour into the bottle. Pour as much as you want, how much, whatever. Um, I just pour like that much, maybe a, a quarter of the bottle is fine. Uh, or maybe you wanna do half and half, you do you. Put this on the top. So if you're not gonna use them this way, one option if you're painting is that you can unscrew this and you can use this little this little hose and you can, you know, dab some of it down and you can use it that way. Uh, or you can use a dropper and you can extract some and, and drip it on. But I just like the, the whole idea of having it because there are times that I like to paint with them, especially uh, during the season, even if I'm doing a background. Now this tip I learned from Kath. The first time I did this uh, in a live, man, did I struggle. Oh my word. And then she's like, oh, you need to know about this. It's so much easier. So what you want to do when I'm building these, I have them like in a compartment. I have like the ball bearings in a cup, the nibs in a cup, the caps, and I have them in that order so you don't forget to drop in this little ball bearing. 
So you're gonna drop that in. That's what's going to mix. Uh, some people have used like plastic beads and all that. I don't find that it's heavy enough, but again, whatever works. You're gonna take this plastic nib and you're gonna set it in there straight up and it kind of, it kind of clicks once, if you will. Now, normally I was like, take your thumbs and push down and oh, it was awful. This is so stinking easy. Cath, so easy. Cath, thank you. Take the cap, place it on the top and just tighten and keep tightening it. It will want to stop, tighten it until you like, you'll feel it click. Or did you hear it? Maybe even heard it click. I heard it. What that did is that literally popped the nib in and you're Man. done, done. And now you're ready ready to use it Cass, super, my one super and only great idea. it was a great idea not, Cass. True, Cass. not at all it's so good then what we did to swatch these of course is did the same thing just use the the larger label painted it out and then just stuck it onto the bottle because again it's the same sticker material so it will stick to this curvy little bottle and now you have your inks you have your your inks used this way but but you can still do more. So I still want to talk about that. You can still do more. Let me get this out of the way. Let me get a little brush because I, that's just how it is. My gosh. Sometimes I wish that, you know, my, my OCD would yeah. just give me a break, but it won't. It's like, it it's like you are not putting that what you are going to label that. I don't care whether you like it or not, you're going to label it. So I'm just going to mix this up. Now these are interesting because they're very fluid. Um, when I take the caps off, especially after I shake it, I normally put it on a paper towel because it gets really, uh, really drippy. But I'm just going to put a little, little bead of ink right there. I'm going to move this tin out of the light. Ooh wee. Okay. Well, I need this to go. No, I'm good. Okay. Take a little brush, pick this color up, and just paint right over the top, and just kind of be a little. I don't know, a little fluid with it, a little swirly. If you paint it in lines, you'll get lines, and that's okay. But just be a little swirly. There you go. It's going to take a second to dry or you can dry it with a hairdryer, whatever. And then that's it. Clean this off with water. Done. Just like watercolor. So essentially it's pearlescent watercolor. That's really what you're making. It's going to allow us to, to color and paint with our mica stains. And the beauty of them painting with a mica stain is look at that color. Stunning, right? So here's another thing. Let's say you're going to paint with them. Now that I paint with them more than I used to, because when I first did them, yeah, I made them and I was like, that was fun. But honestly, guys, I didn't really use them because it was a hassle. I was like, I got to get this out. I got to drip it on here. Then I use it. Then I didn't use it all. And then I was cleaning it up. I'm like, well, that's just stupid. I'll use it this way. Always a solution. So we sell an empty palette. Hey, Mari, could you do me a favor? Sure. If you go around in that top wire drawer, third in, in the back, there's three palettes. Can you grab those, please? Thanks. Sure. They look just like this. Yes. So these are... Yes, please. So these are empty palettes. I launched these with Ranger years ago. They seem really, thank you. They seem really basic and simple, but I couldn't find anything like this in the craft store, okay? Because it has a lid. This is essentially like a watercolor set. And that's what I was doing. I was buying inexpensive watercolor sets and you know, don't email that I was wasting, but I like was ringing out like an ice tray because I wanted the palette with a lid. Um, and then Ranger's like, oh, we, we can do that for you. This you can use for so many things. I have palettes in my studio. This one is alcohol ink. So this is dried alcohol inks in here. So I can just take a brush, dip it in blending solution or rubbing alcohol, and I can paint with alcohol inks anytime I want. This, Distress Crayons. I love my Distress Crayons. They are water reactive. So if you ever want to watercolor with your crayons and you're on the go and you don't want to bring all your crayons because you're just going to do a little bit of coloring, a wet brush or I like to just take a water brush. This is a distressed water brush. It just has water, but either way, it's water reactive. But now if I want, I can just pick up my color, even though this is completely dry, this is water reactive, and now I can watercolor. So I have a full palette of crayons. So maybe I'm gonna use it for paper dolls, whatever. So I've got one for crayons. <laughs> then I have it for my distress inks and oxide. Okay, so uh, the oxide one is a little bit more cloudy. This one is mica stain, but you can do an ink one and an oxide one. The Distress inks, they'll never dry in here. So unlike the crayon and the alcohol ink, which dry, this is re-inker. So this is a drop of Distress re-inker. <laughs> this never dries, but it gels. So you see how like this palette was probably made, mm, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago, and it's still not dry because Distress ink doesn't dry in plastic. But the cool thing about this one, this one is like 
way, way intense. Oh, this is my oxide one. I can see it's oxidized right there. So what you do is if I put my brush in just a little bit of ink, let me just show you the, the intensity of the color. Look at that. It's super intense. So, and this is an oxide, so we're getting that, that dye and pigment. Pretty cool. Same thing with a, a water brush. I think a lot of people, when they use a water brush, they don't think to just dip it in water to clean it. But it's just like a paintbrush. I'd rather dip it in water to clean it than squeeze all the water through it. But so there's a palette. So that was like, well, hello, Captain Obvious. Just make a palette for your mica stains. That's super easy. People Thanks, Mario. Be making palettes all weekend. Well, yeah. here's the thing. So this is my palette of mica stain. You can see that for the most part, it's pretty dry. But it doesn't dry completely because again, mica stain doesn't dry on plastic. But Instead of me dripping the ink here to use, I've now made my palette of all 36 colors. So it's in order. Maybe you want to label it or swatch it. That's fine. I can just pretty much determine by looking at it what color or close to the color. But this holds 36. So this will hold all your mica stains. So even if you don't want to do the bottle, this is what I'm trying to, to tell you. Because this is not about like, oh, go, go buy a bottle of this and a bottle of that. If you're not going to use it a lot, and you're not going to use the bottles, you can still make a palette just from your sprays. You can shake it up and then take an eyedropper or a pipette and you can drip all the colors in here and leave it in. You can fill the well if you wanted to. I wouldn't recommend filling it, but you could certainly cover the surface. But what's nice about this is because I have both, if, if my palette needs more color, I can just shake it up and add some color. But even the ink that's in here, that little drop, you can still use without adding any more because it is water reactive. So just like this one, let's take a little bit of, oh, what do I want to try? We'll do something purpley, okay? Um, yeah, we'll do this one. Mm, this is a little fortune teller. All right, so I just dipped my brush in there and look at, look at that color. So this is going to be mica stain. And when it dries, you're going to get that same mica shimmer because you don't have to shake your palette. There, it, has, it doesn't have an ability to separate. So your mica and your ink just stay perfectly fluid. So that's a whole other, that's a whole other option for you. And it's funny because people are like, well, why don't you sell it this way? Why don't you sell it this way? But I just said, I don't like to do that because as makers, we're innovative people. We make things. So why not get more mileage out of our purchase than purchasing this bottle, a set of it already done because this palette, I assure you is much more inexpensive, empty. And the fact that you can fill it with a lot of other mediums, bottles much cheaper just to buy empty bottles than if this product was in the bottle so i think that really gives you a little bit of, of versatility but painting with these they're amazing because the color is intense but when it dries you still get that mica shine so i want you to think of these i want you to think of the mica stains even though they're seasonal meaning they're brought out for the season it is an everyday product so having them the way you would use it as a maker be that in a spray, be that, and maybe you've seen these and you've never purchased them because you don't like sprays, but now you can just put them in a bottle. You know, who knows? Maybe, I mean, we've, we've done different tops. Maybe there's different options. I'm not sure, I, but I like that little nib and I like the ability to shake it, okay? So those are some tips when it comes to creating with a palette. So how could we do this like other ways? Well, let's do some backgrounds. Did I cover that? I tried to cover that before I get into the crayons. I did okay, you did great. Mario? Okay, thanks. Sometimes I think I just ramble on, but it's really like all the popcorn ideas just pouring out of me at once. So if I sound like I ramble, I apologize. It is my everyday struggle in no, my head. Never of reading your it is my, thank you. It is my struggle. But see, when you annoy yourself, that's when it's bad, <laughs> see? You know, there's some people that are just annoying and they don't even know it. But when you annoy yourself, then you can only imagine what you're, what you are to someone else. It's like next level. All right. Thanks. So let's talk about backgrounds with the sprays. Let's, let's get into that. There's many ways that you can, you can work with this. You can work in a splat box if you want to just miss one specific thing. We can certainly work on our, our mat if we're going to just do a background. But because I'm going to get really really super messy. I just want to have, I'm going to peel this off. Okay. So that is the mat that comes with it. I'm going to put down the media surface mat real quick, but you can work directly on the glass if you want. Don't think you have to do all of this prep work. You do what works. 
I'm just gonna do a media surface mat. This is that same material that's here. It's just a big version. You can see that mine is getting a lot of love because you see it's getting stained and all that. But this has a silicone backing, so this will work on your glass media mat or your table, but it just provides a nice surface. Don't worry about the air bubbles because it's not permanently attached. As long as you can smooth most of them out, you can get out of, you can get your little squeegee if you want. Let me grab that little squeegee. Mario's taking the other squeegee, now it's in the bathroom. The one that I had, remember? That's right. Yeah, he's like, that's a good squeegee. That's All right, awesome. I'll just use this. Okay, that's enough, we'll be, we'll be good with it. I'm just gonna work on this because I wanna be able to like drip and drop and do all of those cool things with it, okay? So surfaces, as I mentioned, there's a lot of other surfaces that you can work on. As long as they're porous, different types of papers are gonna work, uh, even down to craft, even down to black. If you work on black, I'll have a piece here just to, just to do a little demo on it. You won't see any of the stain color. You won't see any ink because these are translucent inks. All you'll see on black is, is the mica. And that could be okay, but I don't normally use mica stain on black. To me, it's, it's a bit of a waste. So I think that that's, that's good. So when it comes to working on my backgrounds, I'm gonna start with just watercolor. You can work on the textured side or the smooth, whatever you prefer. I definitely want some water because I want my colors to, to move around. And we'll just, we will do a little festive backgrounds. Let's do something wintry to start. So of course I'm gonna use a little bit of frozen fog, but then I also wanna take, oh my gosh, where is Wonderland? There we go. I'm gonna do Wonderland and I'm also gonna do Frosty Mint. So some really nice light colors that we're going to work with. It's also nice if you have your, your caps done because it's easy to match them up later because I won't. Just gonna shake it up. Once I shake it, I'll set that down. I shake. The mica settles, but it doesn't settle super fast. So if you're doing a background and you have your colors, you can just give them a quick shakety shake so they're all kind of ready. And all I do is look at the bottom. If you see sludge, that means there is sludge. There you go. It mixes quick. Then we can take the caps off. And this way, when I go to use it, I can just give it a little, little ringety roo. All right, take a little spray. Just gonna give a little bit of water to start. It's like one spray of water. That means that when I spray these, they just become more fluid, okay, on contact. Otherwise, it would just absorb right into it. Maybe that's what you want. But then I'll go in with a little bit more water and just start kind of moving this around. All right, we're gonna layer this. The thing about layering is drying in between. Okay. So I'm using a heat tool. I'm staying about an inch away from the paper. The Ranger heat tool allows me to to really dry these without cooking the surface. The thing about mica stain, you won't see the shine until it dries, much like the sparkle paste, you won't see it until it dries. And you won't really appreciate your blends either until it dries, but you, you see it, you start seeing it kind of come into focus. Now you see that little drip, do you see how I like took my paper and I went from here to here? As your paper curves, when the moisture gets into it, your ink is gonna go to the edge. If you don't move it out of that puddle, you're gonna end up with a, a line of ink. If you're okay with that, great, you do you. But this, I'm still gonna use it. So that's why I didn't mind hopping out of the way. This is, this is the benefit of having a larger work surface with sprays, is that you can kind of move around, if you will, okay? This doesn't have to be crispy dry, but just dry to the touch. But this is our first layer, and you can see already, look at the, that mica and the color. What I love about mica stain also is that the mica that's in the stain stays attached to that color. So I don't know if the camera's gonna pick that up. I was turning around to see like what Mario sees. Uh, I'm not really catching it, maybe there. But you can see that the blue in Wonderland goes right over that frosty mint because the blue mica stays with that color. It doesn't all float into one color. You could be done with this background. You could say, oh cool, I'm gonna stamp, I'm gonna die cut, or we can just keep going. So next I'm just gonna start splashing around into what's on this sheet because the surface of the sheet and why I didn't want to work on glass is it holds my ink into little pellets, little dots of ink. On glass, this would all migrate together into a puddle. And I love these little drips, these dots, because that's where it's creating texture. So I always like to explain like why I'm working on a surface, not just because, oh, because it's a Tim Holtz surface, you need to get it. No, there's a reason that there's a surface. It just it plays with that medium better for the look I want to achieve. All right, there again, we're gonna dry it. And if you didn't like the drips, you could spray that with water and kind of keep going. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, 
Love this. Mm -mm -mm. You see, and as this builds, it not only builds color intensity, but also that shine, that beautiful shimmer of mica. For those that have mica stain, really, it's just, it is a, a magical, magical thing. Okay, so this, I see it as a little green. I wanna go in, I wanna add some more blue. I'm gonna take some Wonderland. See, it's already, there's a little bit of sludge right there. So I'm just gonna kind of focus that, just to kind of knock it, knock it out of the park. There we go, good to go. So I'm just gonna spray some of that on there, but because I want this to blend in, then I'm gonna go in and add water. When you're adding water, if you want your ink to move, you have to move your paper. You can't will it to move. You can't just look at it and go, ooh, I want you to go over here. You, you have to do it. Move. Well, move I say that, water, look, I never say it to make fun of people. I say it because I have been a maker for many years. And sometimes when you first start out, you get so disgusted, you're like, why didn't it just go over there? I'm like, how is it supposed to? You, you, can't, will it. you can't will it to go. You gotta just pick it up and be like, oh, okay, I don't want that to be there. Oh, let me tap, tap, tap. Okay, now look, now that drip is moving. See, that's the best part of your rambling. That's just how it is. You can't. But there's been many times, and I'm sure makers can agree, that you've looked at something and you're like, oh, I wanted it to do this. Yep. But did you? You may have wanted it, but did you actually help it? Nope. You just wanted it to do it. All right, I'm going to add a little bit more water to this uh, stain that's here because I want to pick up some of that overspray. And this is why I chose not to use a splat box for this particular background because I wanna use up what's here. Now we can see. See now to me, it's, it's an interesting background. I love, I love that. That's really what it's all about. There we are. Just gonna finish drying it. Could this air dry if you were doing many backgrounds? Yes, absolutely. But I think using a heat tool and using it properly, you know, don't use it like this. It's not meant to be hair dry. You can even hear the fan speed kind of uh, worrying because it doesn't really want that. This is just about placing this down. Uh, oh, uh, Mo Crafts, I want to slather sparkle paste. Absolutely. It would be great. The thing, if you did, that, that's a cool thing. If you, but if you put on sparkle, you wouldn't see the mica. So if you're going to do that, I would just use your, your spray stains. But that's okay. I mean, you could still certainly use it over the color. But look at that. That's just... And I love how that mica is just, it's done. It's permanent on there. It doesn't flume off on your hands. It's beautiful, right? Such a good, good background. Okay, let's just keep going. Let's get into, I'm just gonna push these off to the side. Uh, easy to wipe this up, just use a cloth. Let's get into some other, some other backgrounds. So this, we're gonna use some, we're gonna use a little sugary gumdrop. That's gonna be, that's gonna be pretty to use. We'll do a little cocktail party. That'll be some pink. And I think we're going to throw in, uh, let's do a little Harvest Moon. That will be good. Okay, this one's going to be just a, a mixed media tag. It's heavy stock. The thing about that, you're, now you're going to see just how I really get. This is lazy. I just, I don't shake one at a time. Who am I kidding? I just mix them up. You get what you get. You don't throw a fit. Just easier that way. Okay. Then we will take some colors. Let's do, this is a little Harvest Moon. Look at that. Um, the other thing that I will tell you that I do, cause I just did it and I didn't think I, I didn't realize I did it. I have a, a towel that just stuck in my pocket, but maybe you have an apron and you want to put it in your pocket, but I have a cotton towel. And every time I'm done with a sprayer, I always just wipe off that little nozzle. Cause that's also something that can clog uh, in a sprayer. Cause it can just get the tiniest little bit of mica in there. And so, yeah, I just did it without even realizing that I do it, but I, I do it all the time because then it just keeps it so clean. It just makes it easier, but yeah. All right, so I'm gonna add some water because I, again, I don't, I don't want it to look like paintball. I wanna, I wanna get that color moving down the side. There we are, a little bit of blend there. I'm gonna do a little bit more, a little bit more sugar. That's gonna make it kind of peachy, nice. And then we'll just dry this. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, see, sometimes when I'm, when I'm demoing, I always try to just catch like, what do I do? There's no secrets here, it's just, but it is important. So I'm holding this one up to dry because again, see all that ink wants to puddle up? I just wanna keep it onto one side. And I, I love how these colors just have a beautiful striation of color right now. But I'm gonna show you something a little bit different on this one. So this one, as I'm drying it, it's not fully dry. You can see it, how wet it still is. What I wanna do now is I'm gonna go in with water and instead of misting it, instead of spraying it like that, 
I'm gonna slowly squeeze the trigger. See those little drips? That's what I wanna get. So this is a distress sprayer. If you slowly squeeze the trigger, you're gonna get those drips, those water drops. And this is going to give me a whole different look on this background. Those drips of water are gonna start breaking up the color but in a different way. And if you want to soften something, you just go in with your water. The water, it really acts as, as a, beautiful, a beautiful tool for, for moving the color. But this one's going to be super broken up on this first layer just because of that water. And then I'll go in, pick that up, let all that color pull to the bottom. And we'll talk about editing your craft sheet as well, because this, this work surface, I don't just use everything there because it's there. I want to edit. Okay, this is what I have so far. So, so far you can see how, see how that water really broke through that color? It's still not totally dry. I want to use what's here, but when I talk about editing, it just means that when you see big blobs of a color, unless you want that color, you may want to get rid of it. You may want to edit that from being there. Instead of trying to avoid, edit. Because if you're like me, you can be like, don't go in the drip, don't go in the drip, don't go in the drip, boop, in the drip. So. If you get rid of it, then you don't have to worry about it. So I just added a little bit of water. You can see how that made that color a little bit more vivid. And now I'll take this tag and we'll go through this color. See, adding just, it just kind of, and because this is not totally dry, I've kind of worked wet on wet. Remember wet on wet blends, wet on dry layers. So the difference between this one and this one, this was dry in between layers. That's what gave me those really dark spots. This one, we're kind of keeping it fairly wet, and that's just allowing my colors to kind of move together a little bit more, like really beautiful kind of fiery background. So those are the whole thing. Like the whole idea of demos is just so you become comfortable with what, you're, what you have, not being intimidated, not being you know, afraid, like that, that's just what it is. It's about going in and using the product to its full potential. And if you didn't like any of this other step, if you're like, you know what? I like the first layer. Excellent. I didn't. It kind of looked like this weird little vessel going down the side. But if you liked it, great. But I always want you to know that, you know, you're only as good as your next layer. Don't let anything hold you back because you're like, oh, what if it what if it's terrible? Yeah. Well, what if it's way better? So if you kind of get over that fear, it will be way better. So there we go. Look at that background. So pretty. You could finish drying this. You can set it off to the side. You can lift this off. However you want to approach that. But it's a, it's a cool background. So, so far, just, again, these aren't Christmassy at all. Um, could they be? Absolutely. And we'll get into, I promise we'll do some Christmassy backgrounds uh, with those texture paste. Just going to wipe that off. Let's do a, let's do one on craft. This time we're going to go into like some some purples and blues. We're going to take some some ominous twilight. We're going to get a little we're going to get a little grungy here. I told you we're going to use some fallen acorn. And where is my decayed? Yes, decayed. Okay. So this one you can see we're taking a, a turn to the dark side on this one, and that's okay. We'll take these colors, mix them up. All right. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, can you mix mica and color? Yes. In fact. Um, Probably won't do well on this one, but on, on one of them, I'll, I'll use a little uh, ink pad in there as well. So I just check out the bottom. Okay, we're good. Craft uh, is craft is going to blend totally different than these other surfaces. I can tell you right now, watercolor paper is going to blend the best. Mixed media is going to blend the second best. Still going to blend craft. It's not going to want to blend too much, but uh, this is a, a thick enough craft that it, it is pretty, it's pretty durable, pretty stable. Okay, ominous twilight is like these colors guys are intense. Specimen is like this dark <laughs> green brown. Even Mario's like, what color is this? I'm like, it's specimen, isn't it great? He's like, it's really dark. I'm like, I know. And then we have decay. Decay is like this, I don't know. It's just good. I don't even know how to describe decay. It's just so good. All right, so now we've got some green, some purple, um, just kind of moving that around. And this one, while it's wet. I'm just going to press down just to soften that. See how that changed from being like, you know, uh, just a shots of color. I've just pushed that color to create a modeled look without worrying about all the drippage because I like this background. Now, here's another thing. You see this end that didn't take any color because for whatever reason, 
the paper is just being crabby, you can either go in with a little bit of water and move that, or just take your finger and fill in the blanks before you dry it. That's easy. Okay, let's dry this. I'm gonna to try to hold it in the air because I still wanna use that on a different background. But you see how I was able to get it to blend on craft differently, right? And meaning if you, if, you tried to, if you tried to dry it and dab it and dry it and dab it, it wouldn't blend on craft. But if you did what I showed when it's wet, spray it and then just, just press it down onto the craft. See how it just, it creates a whole different vibe. Just gorgeous on craft. I love these backgrounds. So these could be, you could take this paper and die cut leaves out of it. You can stamp on it. You can run it through your embossing folders. Jeez, so many options. Um, and I've got some embossed paper. I'll show you how, what it looks like if your paper is pre-embossed. Mm -mm -mm. See that? Shut the front door. That right there. Come on. Look at that. Look at that split of color on brown paper. See, most makers avoid brown because, you know, you're like, Ugh, brown's going to make mud. No, well, it could. Yeah, it very well could. But there are tricks around it. And this is heavy stock. So this is a much heavier craft paper, but pretty great. Completely different effects with mica stain. It's not just a, you know, one dimensional wonder. So we're going to still use what's down here. We're going to see what we can, what we can pick up from that. But I'll just do something. I'll use something a little, little lighter. This is watercolor. We'll pick this up. And let's just, let's just pick up some of that color. It's going to be sludgy and mucky, but it's going to be beautiful nonetheless. Because if you, if you like mud, look at that. Embrace the space. Embrace some of that white space. It's going to be great. Here we go. Okay. Uh, Amy asks, if you press it to another craft, would it do the same thing? It, it would, but it wouldn't. And I'll, I'll explain why it wouldn't do it as much. If you, uh, the question was, if we sprayed this background, if we put another piece of craft on top of it, would it do the same thing? It would move it, but the color, a lot of this color, it's like splitting the difference. And so your saturation of color would be less, but yes, you could do it. Uh, that face-to-face -face works really well on say watercolor paper or something that's gonna pop the color, but absolutely you could put two of them together. I think by doing this on the, the craft sheet, I was able to kind of create that surface tension because often when you push papers together, it pushes everything out to all the ends, but give it a shot. You might, you might like that effect better. I just feel that I have a little bit more creative control on the sheet because I can, you know, press and dip in different areas to keep the purple here and the green here, but good work. Look at that background. Ooh, so good. So see, you could just keep going and really you just, Add a little more, a, a water is what's going to keep this alive. You can see as soon as I added water, you can pick up the, the purples and the greens. That's just really important. Now, maybe you don't want it to be splotchy. Maybe you just want to create like a striation of color and do that. Maybe you're going to create that background and maybe you're going to stamp a, a silhouette of a wildflower in there. Cool. Or maybe you're going to have flying bats or a ghost. Totally different. And see, many people who would have totally given up on this background because you just think it's all it's all muck it could be depending on how you how you use it just going to get rid of that just do a little editing with my cloth and we'll finish drawing that see that's decayed you see decayed right here that's what i said i don't know what it is about that color but man it just it has some really great gold in there almost like a fool's gold just love the color of it okay so let's take a look at these backgrounds real quick I'll clean this up. I could keep going and going, but honestly, I don't want to just keep going and going with the same. Okay, there we go. Okay, that's kind of clean. So here we are with this background. Those colors applied completely different ways. Craft, watercolor dabbed, watercolor swiped. Same inks, completely different look, depending on how you want to to approach the mica stains. And that's the thing about these stains. Like you look at them and you're like, oh, that's just like brown ink. And then the light hits it. You're like, whoa, that's, that's magical. Even when it's in its lightest, faint, washed out look, you still get it. And all of that is, is on there. Amazing. Okay, we'll do one more background and then I'm gonna grab those uh, textures. Mario, can you check to see if those are dry? Yeah. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a little bit of watercolor. Here we go. All right, perfect. 
All right. So on this, thanks. All right. So on this one, I'm just going to uh, add a little bit of water and then we'll just take some of the colors that we have. Ooh, I'm almost at a cocktail party. That's, that's going to be something. A little sugary gumdrop. There's a little cocktail party. Let's take a little bit of Yuletide. There we go. Thanks, Mario. You're welcome. All right, let's take a little bit of, where is Flickering Candle? I know you're around here somewhere. There you are. Flickering Candle is really cool. It's, it's a favorite. Oh, see, it's almost gone. Oh, come on. There we go. All right, let's take a little bit of, hmm. Oh, I'll do Merry Mint. I don't mind. That, that's going to be fun. All right, and then let's take, let's take a little bit of Shiny Bobble. And we'll take a little bit of Fortune Teller. I think I'm Fortune Teller. I might even go uh, over here on this side. There we go. Okay. Just going to spray this with water. Bring this up to a linear fashion. I don't know if you can see, but I've I have it kind of standing up this way. This way, when I add some water to it and the color starts to blend, it just blends into itself on rose. Okay, I'm gonna dry it. I'm, I know I'm kind of off frame, but I'm, I got too many bottles over here. Okay. There we go. Nice, nice, nice. Nice colors, nice blend. Now, of course, there's so much ink down here just to put in so many different things. It's crazy. Crazy, crazy. All right, look at that. Woo -wee. I just want to show you on this one that you can use as many colors. They blend beautifully, but it's the mica. That's why, you know, I just thought, why not do, why not do a rainbow just to show you? Because I could see that that yellow went into the green. This just proves my point that I think sometimes people hear it, but maybe they don't understand, which is the mica and the color are attached to each other. So for example, here on Flickering Candle, it still went in to Merriment and it was yellow on green because of that pigment. Pigment dominates dye. So that yellow mica is able to sit on top of the green, the green on the blue. So it makes for a really cool blended background because it doesn't matter how you apply them. Whatever color goes, it's, it's gonna take its pearl with it. Does that make sense? I hope it does, but it's really, it's a, a great thing. And this I think could be grand, a beautiful background to die cut from. We can, you could still add more water to it. You could blend it because these are going to be water reactive. And then of course we have, you know, unlimited color down here that, that we can just play with. All right, let me get these caps out of the way. I'm going to move this off to the side. Okay. Let's just use this up real quick. I'm not going to dry the ones that I do. I'm just going to spray them and let's just go real quick into just do a bunch of, bunch of quick little tags. These are little number fives. These will be great. They'll be fun. That's going to be a good color. You get what you get. You don't throw a fit. Okay. Well, we'll just keep going. I like these. I mean, the number fives are great because often they could do a lot of cool stuff for like die cuts. I think that's good. I'm going to put a little bit. There's some yellow right there. I see it, but it's not really visible till I add a little water and then it comes to life. I can just add a little bit of yellow in that spot. There we go. All right, now I would just keep going, but I'm not for the sake of the demo. Mario, can I hand these off to you, please? Sure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. It's like you almost need that like medical tray, but I'll just give you these. Yeah. I'll show them to you real quick. Here's what I have from cleanup on aisle three. We're gonna let those dry. I'm gonna just let those air dry. We'll see those later. Thank Good. You. Thanks. Sure. And we'll clean this off. Okay. So now let's go back to the ones with that stencil, that stencil paste, that texture paste. Look at that. It's totally flexible. But what's cool about this paste is that it is designed to be porous. So there's many different pastes. If you did a translucent one, it would work as a resist. But this one is one of my favorites, especially with mica stain. And you'll see why in a second. Uh, it does something different. The stain permeates the paste and the mica like goes around the texture. I don't know. It's, it's really crazy cool. Okay. For this one, I will work in my splat box just because I'm going to focus on one thing and I don't need to worry about loading up a background, but uh, 
just to show how, how you can use your splat box, but I'll do the other one without. Okay, for this one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose some greens and reds. So I'll have a bunch of different greens here, holly branch being one of them. I love this one, it's like crushed olive. I've got Yuletide somewhere. See, they're all rolled over here, guys. You get it. The struggle is real. Okay, and then I want a little, where is fresh balsam? Is that it? Okay, here we go. Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, so shaking up, I'm just gonna kind of follow what I think is here, which are gonna be like some greenery, maybe a little berry, a little pine cone. I'm not gonna do any masking. You just kind of get what you get. But this one, I'll probably be a little bit closer. Um, and I'll blend later. So this one I didn't add water to first, okay? So this, I'm just going to add a little bit of green to the areas. This, and this may not be for everyone. If, if this isn't your, that one's not going. If this one isn't your jam, you could certainly uh, go in with a, a brush and you can color this, that's gonna be fine. Let me add a little bit of, here we go, a little bit of Yuletide. It's gonna go right there. That's gonna go there, it's gonna go there. Let's add a little bit of, where is fallen acorn? There we are. A little bit of brown. Shakety shake. A little pine cone there. I think I spotted another one. Oh, where did it go? Well, I'm going to say it's there. Okay. Then I think I will add a little bit more holly branch just because I really like that one. And maybe we'll just do a little bit of tree lot. Not much, but some. Okay. Oh, I do see a pine cone right there. I'm going to add, there we go. Next, I'm gonna add a little bit of water just to try to fill in the blanks. So I'm not using a lot, but I am just kind of doing little, little short blasts of water. See that? This is what we have. Kind of a fill in the blanker. Now we're gonna dry it. Okay, take this out. Take this off, because I don't need to dry my paper towel, although you could. There we are. And I'm gonna keep the paper towel just to do some, some editing along the way. So as I'm drying this, I am gonna just use the paper towel just to absorb any, any areas that I feel are dark. And we don't judge it until it's done. Then you could judge away, but still, just kind of, just kind of dry it. Okay. Beautiful. Ah, nice. Because this is where the colors just really come to life. And I'm drying this all the way. So you can see like how that's still really wet. I'm just going and drying. Fallen acorn is a new brown we did for Halloween. So, so good. Okay. So what we end up with is the paste taking on the same color property as the background. Okay, that, that to me is really important to understand what's going on here because we're we're going to modify this quite a bit we're going to change how it how it looks in a minute so this is totally pliable still but you can see you see how shiny that color is but do you see what i mean about the mica really it covers the whole thing you can see it but it really creates this beautiful buildup around that texture because i think those uh, pigments kind of settle in and they create almost like a highlight outline so right now if you look at it from a distance there we go you can see that the texture kind of, I'll just say, disappears into the background. And that's okay, because the background is a background because it's in the background. But if you want to see your texture, if you want it to be more visible, you do have some options. And that is to uh, either spray this with water or you can spray uh, a paper towel with water, however you want to, to create with this. But the water is gonna re-wet this ink, okay? So let's just start with just a, a damp paper towel, just so you can see what I mean. So if I have water on a paper towel and I place it over the design and I lift, it's gonna start lifting off the ink from that paste, okay? And I'm just pressing and lifting. That's what it's doing. Press and lift, press and lift. So I'm just going into like the pine cone. See, I'm just, I'm using that damp paper towel to pull color off of whatever I want. So maybe it's gonna be those little berries because as long as, as long as these mica stains are on this paper, they will always re-wet with water. They're not gonna come off on your hands, but they're gonna re-wet with water. This now, do you see the difference in the background? 
You see how you can see the pattern more than you did before and see how like light those leaves are? It still has color, it still has shine, but you're able to pull some of that color out of that texture paste to make your background brighter. Could you go in and add color? Yes, we could take those inks that we did and if you had a palette, you could go in with a brush and you could color those berries red because it would sit on top of that. You could add more highlights. You can keep going and going and going on this, but I think it's important to understand that just because you do something with a water-based medium, it doesn't mean it's forever there. Use that water-based feature to your advantage. Take it and manipulate it. Some people get freaked out because it, we don't talk about sealing here. I mean, people ask all the time, like, how do you seal it? How do you see? We don't talk about sealing because you don't need to seal your work. Anything that you use should not come off on your hands from the touch. If, if it's going to be wet or outside, craft products are really not meant for that. You need permanent inks and things like that. This isn't going to come off on your hands. And I think having that feature, that water-based feature is important to me because I love the ability to go in and to me, this has so much more depth and highlight. It's just, it's really, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful background to me. Okay, let's take... You don't want me to sing it about... We're about <laughs> no, licensing. Uh, um, so let's take, uh, I think we'll do a little peppermint stick and yuletide. Let's just do, let's just do red on this. Some people might see this as a crime scene. I think it's going to be really good. All right, there you go. We're going to take these reds. And we're just going to do all over redness. This, because I want it to be blended, I'm going to add some water on this. We'll do a little peppermint stick. That's going to be more of a warm red. And then we're going to use Yuletide. And you're going to see, whoo, yeah, that's just so good. Okay. And we'll dry it. Just a quick, easy, easy background. Beautiful good mix now if you wanted this in pink you could do pink you could do greens you can do all sorts all right so now we're just going to dry it and what i like about having different reds could you do it all the same sure you could but having different you're going to see because it's mica stain that we have a wonderful dynamic a wonderful shift of color throughout this background one is going to be a warm red and one is going to be a cool red Take a look at that. See, even the change of that mica. You see how from that warm red, it's got that warm red mica and that cool red, it's kind of a bluer red. I just think it's really, it's a cool background and you could, you can leave it like that. Or again, let me just clean this off. A little bit of water, I'm using a lot of water. I can tell, there we go. Mario, would you mind just get topping, sure. topping that off? Yeah, Thank you so much. Okay. So on this particular one, I'm just going to dab. I like that little striation because I wanted it an inky background. Um, and you can also see that I left a lot of, I'll just say space, white space. Because another thing about a spray is sometimes I want a background to look like it's been sprayed. I want, I want to see that open area of cardstock. So I didn't totally saturate it with color like I did here. So that's why when you saw me spray, I was like, Ch -ch 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 couple spaces and then you embrace the space. You have creative options. You as the maker, you do what, what you like. You do you. Thank you. Sure. Um, so just a tip, I share this, well, whenever I think about it. Uh, if you have one of these sprayers and you'll notice that the little, see how the little straw goes at an angle? You wanna make sure that this straw piece, see this little piece right here? You wanna make sure that the tip of this is facing it's going the same direction as your sprayer. You see that? So you might want to check your bottle. Like, let's say it's going out of the back. That's not going to be good. It's going to always act like it's empty. Okay. And this is any spray bottle, not just this one. You can do this with any spray bottle, but you want your straw, your tube to point the same direction as your sprayer. This way, when it's in the, in the bottle, when you tip forward, you see how your water, it creates an air bubble. If your straw was coming out of the back, you would always suck up air and you would think that your spray bottle is not working. You're like, oh, this is not spraying. Well, it's because when you're, when you're using it like we do as a maker, you're usually pointing it straight down. You're not holding it up like, you know, maybe if you were at the salon and they were spraying, it's, it's pointing up. This is always down. So that air bubble, even if your bottle is full, is going to be there. So just make sure that it, it stays in the water. Does that help? Okay. 
We're going to lighten this just a bit. There you go. And we'll dab this on. Just going to lighten a couple of areas. Just again with that paper towel, just because I think that it's it will show up uh, just that text a little bit more. It's not a lot, but I do love that. See, I love how that just that effect. That's the fun thing about texture paste. Okay, there you are. Perfect. Yep. See, always always the random things with me. You never know. Look at that. Beautiful. Well, you never know. Look, at, but look at just look at what texture paste does. Uh, with mica stain it's like you know you think that they're tags and then boom you get that just that shine of like wow 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 so good okay moving on let's keep going let's do a little bit of embossed paper i'm gonna look at the time oh boy boy a couple hours already i better keep going all right so embossed paper let's say you have some embossing folders that you want to uh, add some color to as i mentioned you could start with your background and then you could run it through your embossing folder. But if you have an, a pre-embossed paper, it's pretty cool because the, the peaks and valleys, if you will, will hold this medium differently. Remember, we're dealing with mica stain. So we're dealing with a colorant and a pigment. So the colorant's gonna go wherever, but the pigment is always gonna wanna settle. Just like it settles at the bottom of your bottle, it's gonna wanna settle in all of these little crevices of an embossed design, which is really cool, right? Okay. This one, this is one of my favorites because to me, it reminds me of a snowflake. I just, I love this, this 3D folder. So on this one, we're gonna go full on wintry. We're gonna do snow flurries. We'll even throw in a little juniper berry. I've got a lot of different blues and we're gonna throw in some frozen fog. We'll throw in a little winter frost, all the blues, all the lights. Now, could these be purple? Yes, I know there's a lot of purple fans. So yes, it could be purples. It could be whatever wintry colors, but it's gonna be very heavy on the frozen fog because that's, that's going to be the white one. These other ones are just going to add a little bit of depth. Okay. So let me shake it. shake these, these, because I don't know where the clear top is. I don't want to do that because ink could fly everywhere. So this shake it, shake this. There you go. Shake. There we go. Shake. Okay. Now let's go for it. We want this to blend. Look at all that. Oh my gosh. We want this to blend. So I'm just going to give it one splash of water. I don't want too much because I really want that ink to kind of settle in. I'm gonna start with some frozen fog because that's the base that I want, which is gonna be mostly white. Then I'll use a little winter frost. And you can see on this, for this spray, I'm kind of like spraying and moving, like just getting a little bit of stuff. A little shiny bauble, because I don't want, I don't want too much. A little Wonderland, Wonderland's gonna be nice. There we are. Did you talk about which folder you were using? And then, uh, I don't, oh, which, oh, uh, I don't know the name of this folder. I don't, I don't know if it's called, it's not called Entangled. It's called Yummy. I don't really know what it's called. It was one I did at Christmas. Well, Sizzix is here. I'm sure they're going to know. Well, Zoe's here. Zoe will know. What is, what is it called? Anyone, anyone? 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 Yeah. It's called, see, it's because it's not called Snowflake. That's the problem. You can just call it yummy from now on because if you order, just say I think it might be called like engraved. engraved. Oh, there we go. See? Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks. Yeah. Because it's, it is an engraved design, but when we cropped it, I'm like, it looks like the most beautiful snowflake. Um, but of course you can use it. Like when you do it in coppers and metals, it definitely looks like engraved metal. But um, yeah, it was one of those that I didn't call it snowflake, but it, but it did come out at Christmas. But I was like, it just looks, it's so beautiful. And when you see it with mica stain, it's just, oh my gosh, it's, it's a gorgeous folder. It really is. I think because I didn't call it snowflake, nobody really saw it as that. But do you guys, see, I just, I totally see a snowflake, but look at that background. So the big shine that you're seeing, the, all of this like luminous, that's frozen fog, because again, that's gonna be uh, that white pearl. But it was really important to me to have those undertones of like wonderland and snow flurries and you know we could still mix this even more you could still go in even after it's dry and add water and this stuff is going to move again so you can get that color to kind of move wherever you want it to be but when we dry it it's still going to just kind of sit within that texture oh i do like that i added some of that let me just tapity tap just to kind of get some of that blue out of there and i even think i'm going to edit that 
Remember edit. So it's like to me, my eye is going right to that spot. So I'm just going to edit that. You just take out some of that stuff. Rewet it and edit. That's it. Rewet and edit. Oh boy. I've got paper towels in my water. Oh my word. Okay. Look at that. Oh yeah. That is so good. But I just want it, I want it all the way dry so you can see what I mean about by having those mica stains on pre-embossed paper that it really just sits into all those crevices because of that mica. See, look at that. I mean, come on. That's yummy. Hence the folder. Let's see that. That's it. It is called yummy. Isn't it? It's just so pretty. It's, it's such a beautiful wintry thing. And because of those micas having different colors, it's a different color shift, right? That's, that's what it's all about. And of course I would, every single time, just, just so I'm clear, I would be using this in the real world. I would just, you saw me do it at the beginning where you spray some water and you do paper, but you know, I, I can't do that during a demo because it just, it slows down the process. All right. But that's glorious. Really pretty on, on embossed paper. Yeah. Here's the, let's see, do I have that folder? I do. See, that's the detail of that folder. Cool. Right? So good. And on metallic paper, I mean, this one, I think that's why I called it engraved because it does look like engraved, um, engraved metal. Oh, we got some folders out. Let's talk about this. That'll get me into crayons and then we'll jump to textures. So I did this maybe, maybe last year where, uh, talked about taking em embossed paper, any design that you might have, whether it's craft or black and kind of doing some double, uh, embossing, if you will, where we're doing some colors and then we're also doing backgrounds. That's a fun thing to share. And that'll get me to talk about the crayons. The crayons for me, it's just something that I like them. Don't get me wrong. I like them, but I use them for a very particular outcome. Okay. So I keep my crayons separate. I like, I keep them out of population of the rest of the crayons because the crayons themselves, other than the names, and yes, the cap has a little bit of a pearly sheen to it. It doesn't say that it's a mica crayon the way they say mica stain. So if you put these with your other crayons, you might be doing some watercolor and you might not want mica and you'd be like, Ooh, gosh, why do I have mica here? So these are a, a mica crayon. It's the same property as the other distress crayons, except it has that coordinating mica color. So everything that you do with distress crayons, smudging, uh, coloring, water coloring, you can do. I love the palette. Again, it has that wonderful, I mean, you can see right here, that wonderful shine. You can use them as is, just like crayons. You can color them. You can uh, smudge and blend. This on craft, they are magic. Like to me, the mica, the mica is a little lost on white paper, but on craft, on every single color, it's like, boom, even down to the the soft colors is beautiful. So I like crayons on craft and black. See, it's just different. Every, every medium has a purpose and you have to do what you like. So on this one, I've embossed this 3d poinsettia. Um, the 3d poinsettia came in two sizes. I'm not sure if it's even still available anymore, but that's not what the demo's about. The demo's about understanding the product and using what you have. Okay. So this particular one, what I like to do is go in and smudge color. I could color with this directly. I could scribble it on my craft sheet and watercolor, but I like to smudge color on my embossed folder and I'll show you why I will take out. I mean, I'm not here to, to try to, you know, torment you about new color crayons. They're coming, but I will incorporate some new colors, but I'm just going to take the color and literally swipe my finger across. See how I pick up the color, kind of like a lipstick. It's very, it's kind of creamy. And then I'm just going to smudge colors. I'm just going to go in with my fingers and color. And the reason I'm doing it this way, you'll see in a minute is I want to have most of the color hit the high points. Now the thing with crayons, they dry, they get old. Um, and the thing about this medium is when you first get a new crayon, they are kind of creamy dreamy. And the longer you have them, let's see, let's take a look at maybe peppermint stick is like that. Yeah. They start to shrink around the edge. See how it's kind of shrinking and they become like firmer, like a thicker wax stick. They still work that, but they definitely change their property. They're meant to be used. So if you just have crayons that you're not using, I'm, I'm afraid by the time you get to them, they might just be sticks, but they'll still work. If you add water to them, they're just not creamy for this 
technique of smudge coloring, okay? So I'm just, again, using, using my fingers. And I'm not being particular. You'll see also why this is. And we'll do one on black, okay? Little cap, and the cap matches the base, so that's easy. If you're going to change color, which I will, I'm going to go into uh, a little bit of pink. I want to just clean my finger. These will clean right off. I just dipped it in water and just wiped it off. So you want to take off that mica. This way you're not just coloring with the same thing. Can you tell? Like there's literally a wall right here. Okay. Let's go into some winterberry. Oh, winterberry. See, it's really, <laughs> that's okay. It still works. I'm just doing a little highlight of pink. I'll, I'll show you exactly what I'm doing. A little highlight of that. And we'll do a little bit of cocktail party because that's a little bit brighter pink. And you, you could do one color if you want. You do what works. All right, let's stick to the bottom. Let's get some greens. Maybe I'm even gonna throw in a little specimen and we'll take some yellow here. Okay. So this to me is like, this is easy coloring. It really is. It's so easy because you can just sit and, and color and color and color. And it doesn't matter how fast you are because you're not trying to blend it. You just, you get to just do you. So it's super easy to, to add this color. I love this point set. This was actually from a, a vintage postcard, this design. I was so inspired by uh, the relief of that. But there are so many beautiful 3D folders. Oh my gosh. The ones that just came out for Stamp Timber from Simon Says. Oh my word. That's like, there's this wreath, this festive. I, I got to get that. I mean, that's the whole thing. You, you know, every, every different design of something becomes a tool for something else, right? When you think of it like that, because maybe you're like, oh, I never really use that because, you know, I'm a stamper and I want to stamp. There's some designs that like this one, it's just a standalone. It's just a standalone thing. We're going to take a little, it's a little harvest moon. I'm going to try to just want to smudge on the top and you'll, you'll see where we're at. We can always go back and add some color. Okay. Here's where we're at. So right now, I've added color and you can be totally done at this point. Oh, look, there's some, there's a little harvest moon right there. Okay. You can be totally done at this point, but we're not going to be, we're going to add another, another effect. But before we do, I'm just going to color one on black. That one will do a, a little different. Maybe I'll go into some, some teals and purples and a little bit of green. Okay. See, why not? Because who said they have to be red? They don't. Now on black, it's going to be, it's just going to be really different. That's all I can, that's all I can say. Um, it's still pretty. It's kind of like a, a velvet painting. But you'll see how these colors really shine. And all I'm doing right now is a base coloring. I'm going to add more color to both of these later. So when, when I'm smudging on this one, it's just different. That's all I can say. I'll show you in just a second. It's just different. It's not as intense as this to start, but it will get there. Okay. I do love these because could you do this with the regular crayons, the regular distress crayons? Yes, but you won't get this shine. They're just going to act more like a pigment stick. Uh, also, if your finger is still wet, because I just cleaned it, the crayon won't come off on your finger. It needs to come off on something. There we go. <laughs> something dry. I was like, we're not getting any color here. Okay. Now here's the big difference on this one. So here you can see like it, it's there. I mean, you can't really see it from far away, but yeah, that color is there, but it highlights so, so beautifully. We'll, we will do that and take a little frosty mint, go over those leaves, a little here, a little there, a little here. So that's also like, you know, I'm just in the habit now when I'm done using the crayons that I just, I put the cap on. They don't, I'm not going to say that they dry up quick, but if you haven't used yours like in a year, that's too long. That is too long. A little bit of yellow. Don't need much, but I'm going to throw back a little bit of purple. Just want, want more of that brighter purple. Let me go into, I think I'll, I'll go back into this one. So this one, watch this. I'm going to add a little bit of, of purple, but this time I'm just going to see, I can just drag that over the top just to add a little highlight and then I'll smudge it in. Okay, that was a cheat. Cheat for my smudge coloring. All right, here we go. So with these, like I said, you can leave them as is. 
But if you add another step or add another layer, it's pretty amazing what you can do with embossing folders. And hopefully that inspires you to get out your folders and use them with mediums like this. Okay, we've already talked about using it with sprays, but using it with, uh, with this. So I'm gonna take my fold away. Let's see how this works, Mario. You know, well, I might. I never, I never get along with machines on camera just because, well, I need like extra hands. And normally I'm like pushing it into my, pushing it into my stomach and all that. So here's what we've got for, I got both of these folders. Okay. Oh, did, what, what did she do? Okay. Oh, okay. So for this one, so one I'm going to use archival. Yeah, you'll see Mario's hands pop. Oh, did you already pop in your hands? Is that what you were doing? I'm like, you'll see his hands because I'm going to need, I'm going to need help with this. Okay. But here's what we're going to do first. So for this one on craft, I want to add the details in. And in order to add the details in, I'm going to need, <laughs> look, everything's buried. In order to get this, I'm going to need to add some black ink. So I'm going to take my folder, open it up on the, where it's the smoothie side and my design is deboss, and I'm going to use archival ink. It could be whatever color. Archival is oil-based, so it will be permanent, so it will transfer, um, but it will go on top of the crayon. Other inks I've tried, like I've tried this with oxide, I've tried this with regular distress ink, and I just didn't get it to create the same effect. I'm just going to use the black. If you have the larger uh, black, you can use that. And you can try different inks, but I'm gonna just do it in like a swirly motion. So I'm just inking this, my folder, just swiping this in a circular motion and kind of creating a, a little, see a little smudge around the end. I'm not doing the whole folder, I'm just doing it around that design. Then I'm gonna put the top on. I'm gonna take my embossed smudge color design I'm going to like lock it into the folder because it'll, it'll see where it was before. It kind of locks into that place. I'm going to close this up. No water, no nothing. And we're going to <laughs> emboss and we're going to try. So I'm going to place this in, place it at an angle if you can. And normally because 3D folders, I just run that through once it's engaged. Thanks Mario. You're welcome. Thanks. Good. Just going to run that through. And all that's going to do is print the ink into that area. Look at that. Isn't that cool? It's like high def. It just, it took the design that was color and kind of bleeding off the page and just gave it this artistic detail because the black pushed in to all those areas. Now, could you do this again? Yes. Could you do this with brown or you could do this with any color, but I love that like smudgy where it's almost like a, a charcoal painting. But if you wanted to do this fully inked, you absolutely could. Okay, but I just like that this look because then I would maybe splat it with foundry wax or maybe you'd splat it with mica stain. We can do that to that. That'd be totally fine. Okay, to clean it off the folder, you were going to clean it off with whatever you would clean archival ink off. You might get some crayon in there, so you may want to run this underwater, but just hand sanitizer, stamp cleaner will clean off archival from that folder. Really simple. Okay, if you wanted something to be more highlighted. I, I love it the way it is, but you know, some people are like, Oh, I really wish that this had this. That's fine. Now is the time to go in and do that. So we can take, let's see, do we have a, a crayon over here? Let's take something light. Mario's just shaking his head about how much stuff I have thrown everywhere. Let's say we want a little highlight. You can take a distress crayon and you can color over an area and smudge a little highlight. I wouldn't do too much of that because then you start covering up your archival. But you see how I have like a little bit, there's a sugary gumdrop. It's that really pretty kind of corally, that new corally pink. You see how I've just added that? It just adds a little bit more of a, a softer shine around the center. Yeah, absolutely. You could go back and do that. But that is why you want to do your embossing, then your coloring, then your inking, and call it done. This one, the only difference between these is I went in and distress inked the background now. A little brown distress ink, flicked it with some water. So if you want this to be brown, now you can ink this. Totally fine to go in and ink, but cool. Like that just looks like, how in the world did you do that? Secrets. No one would guess that it was crayons and a smudgy little ink pad, right? So same rules are gonna apply on black, but on black, we can't really do black ink because black ink on black cardstock is not gonna show up. So we, we kind of flip the script, we do the opposite. We take this and here are the two that, that I did. You guessed it, we're gonna go in and, and use white. So 
For this one, I'm going to take Picket Fence Distress Ink, which is a white Distress Ink. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to take the mini folder on the smoothie side. We're going to take our ink pad and we're just going to swipe this one. So I want to swipe. I don't want to tap, tap, tap. I really want uh, the inks to just kind of build up a little different, if you will. If you want more white, then well, be a little bit heavy handed. This one, I, I want more white because I like that it looks more wintry. So here you can see I just went around the folder different, but I still left some some space. Take your paper, lock that in there. This one is the Distress Black Heavy Stock. It's kind of it's kind of suede. Let me make sure I'm lined up. Close that folder and we'll go in and emboss it. We'll place this down. Let's see. I should be able to get this one. It's tiny. Let's see. Yep. <laughs> going to in Mario's hand. There we go. Got it. One roll is all you need. That's just going to push that ink in. And there's what we have. Look at that. This one, I'm going to go in and add more color because I, I just want more crayon. Same rules apply. Just clean this out. This one can clean with water because we use Distress Ink. It's water-based. So pretty cool, right, Mario? Very cool. Thanks for the hand. Sure. It's always a great... <laughs> He's like, I'll get it. I, there's stuff everywhere, right? There is. It's how it is. It's a beautiful mess. It is a beautiful mess. Thanks. So this one, I'm just going to go in and add some crayon. That's why you can see that most of my crayons are flat just because of how I use them. I, I never really do detail coloring with them. I always want them just to be just to be flat because on this one, because I'm not really worrying about covering up any black details because the black details are actually from the paper. That's why this one I can do a little bit more coloring because it's forgiving. All, all we added to this was kind of this wintry white vibe. Nice. A little bit of yellow. Not much. Look at that. Ooh -wee. Pretty. Look at that one. So see how that mica just shines, but the white is there. So that's another fun thing to do with crayons. Besides just, just adding, you know, adding your colors to, to whatever it is you're going to color. And if you, if you watch the Halloween live, I showed how you can watercolor a stamped image with the crayons. There's a lot of things I just want to show as many different ideas between the seasons as possible. Okay. So we talked about crayons. We talked about stencils. We talked about paste. I've got a little sparkle, a little stamping. Now, real quick, just to remind you, you can stamp with stain and you can also print with your stencils. So let's take, let's take this one. That'll be a pretty one to do. Oh no, I'm going to take a different one. They're all good. I can't decide. Oh, see stars. This would be so good with sparkle. That's a good one. There's a lot of Christmas stars. I just saw another one. There's a, there's a lot of Christmas stars. I'm going to actually take out the snowy ones too. Okay. Let's print. I see. I can't get it out of my head. I'm going to print with that poinsettia one just because I think I did that before. Maybe I would have done it a couple years ago. So a thing to note about your stencils is that you do have the ability to print with stencils, especially with the mica stain. So let's just say you have your splat box, you have your paper towel. We'll take a, let's take a background. This one doesn't matter because I'm going to actually use the, the ink to print. Take that and we'll take craft. We doing okay, Mario? We are doing so okay. Good. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to spray through the stencil as if I were doing a background. So we're going to take some sugary gumdrop. That's good. We'll take a little bit of this one happens to be peppermint stick because that's what I picked up. We'll take a little bit of, there's not much left at the cocktail party. You can tell it's sounding empty, but man, it's going to be good to the last drop. There we go. That was, that was actually more than I thought. Nice. And then let's take some greens. I'm looking for, I don't want to do specimen. That's going to be too dark because when you get, when you get red and green, red and green makes brown. So, you, you know, it's, it's just going to happen, but this one is just, this one is all about, I don't know, creating just something fun. Okay. So I've just sprayed through the stencil. I'm going to lift off your stencil. It's all about the dismount for this. We're just going to lift this off and we're going to keep the, we're going to keep the ink that's here. This is our pretty background. Pretty right. Just going to let it, we could draw this with a heat tool. I'll, I'll do that in a second. 
But this is what I want to talk about. This thing, this stencil, going to be really, really pretty. So what I want to do on this one, I got to move my snow out of the way, is I'm going to print on paper. So we've got this one. I'll set that aside. I have another piece of watercolor cardstock. This again, this could be a tag, whatever you want to do. But we're going to use that ink and we're going to print it onto something. So that's why I wanted to make sure that my colors were kind of strategic, if you will. I didn't want my stencil to look muddy or it would print muddy. OK. Could you add water to this? Mm, it depends on how much stain you use. I think I have a pretty good amount of stain because it still drips. But if it's a light mist because you didn't use a lot of mica stain, you may want to, you know, mist your stencil like maybe two little sprays of water. You just want to make sure that you have droplets on there. That's important. You want droplets of ink. My paper, I don't need that to be wet at all. What we're going to do is we're going to take our ink and we're going to flip this over and we're going to take our stencil and we're going to place it down. Now ink has surface tension, so don't worry about it raining color at this point. You just, so you have you know time to position it, but I know you think like, oh, I'm going to flip it and all that color is going to come just dripping down. Nope, just lay it down in its place. But once it's there, again, you get what you get. Take something porous, a paper towel. I don't like to use a brayer because that just pushes everything out everywhere. And now I'm just going to print on the back of the stencil. The reason I'm using a paper towel is any ink that oozes out is immediately absorbed into the paper towel. So when I have ink, I flip it over to a clean part and I print. So that means when the ink is getting pressed into the paper, it's starting to shoot out of these openings. And if you don't have anything to mop it up, you're going to get color in the openings. It's not that it's a bad thing but it's just not what I'm necessarily going for. Then once you're happy with it, you're just going to take that and we're going to lift this off. This, could you get another print? Probably it would be pretty faint and subtle, but take a look at the results. The results are quite cool. Um, with your ink, you just get a negative. You're just getting a print of that same ink that we use. So it wasn't like the ink was going to waste, but we got a really great, uh, beautiful look through it. Uh, the question is, could you spray another color? I don't see why you couldn't. Absolutely, you could. I just like the magic, the starkness of color on white and white with color. But yes, you, you could have paste through it. You could do a million and one uh, different ideas. But I always love the, yeah, I think this, the shock factor of, of a, it looks like it's a resist, but it's not a resist. It's just a print. But maybe this, if you didn't want white, maybe you want to start on a, a pre-color paper. Maybe it's a little brown or you let it dry and then you place your stencil back down and then do it. So I would say that if you wanted to add a color, because someone asked, you know, could you spray another color? My advice would be dry it and then place the stencil back down on it and then add a spray. Because my concern would be, because I know that there's wet stain under here, if you added more wet stain, as soon as those colors touch, they're gonna migrate. Because remember, wet on wet blends. So I'd probably dry it, then lay a stencil down and then add my color inside. So there was the, for, for the person that asked that, that would be my suggestion is dry and then stencil a second time. Here we go. I'm just going to dry these so we can appreciate the, the mica shine. And we're in the home stretch. Not too bad at all. We've got one more thing to show and we'll wrap this up because I could go on and on and on, yeah, as Mario yeah. knows. I love it. I just. You get in your demo mode, it's non -stop Well, demo. I love just empowering the imagination because, again, I go back to. 20 years ago when I started, man, people did not want to give up the tricks. They just didn't. It was like that was their livelihood and they were, you know, magician. I'm not going to show a trick. I'm like, it's not magic. It's creativity. <laughs> creativity is meant to be shared. She and I, and I think that that has kind of fueled me where like, man, if you only knew how many things you could do with your products, you'd use them more. You wouldn't be afraid to, to use the stuff that you have because you can just sit and play and you don't have to worry about things messing up. And that's also why I like to do live. Like you just see, like you, you just go with it. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but you, you can't overthink the ink. That's what it is. So there we have it. Take a look at that. Beautiful. Look at that background with the color and that mica. Mm -mm. See how the mica just goes crazy. And then here's the one where we sprayed. So the one we sprayed, that's, that's not dry yet, but you see the one we sprayed is a little bit more even coverage because it's sprayed versus a modeled background. So that's doing a stencil and a stencil monoprint. Absolutely beautiful. Okay. So I'll wrap up with 
just talking about snowfall real quick. I know I talked about it at the beginning about coloring it, uh, but I just wanted to share something, especially around Christmas and why uh, we did snowfall as a, as a seasonal paste, because it is really meant for, for snow. The beautiful thing about this paste is that it is that translucent textured grit that has that little bit of clear sparkle in it. Different than sparkle paste, okay, but it's, it's definitely textured. But what's, what's wonderful about this is how many things that you can do uh, with this paste. And that's really what I want to talk real quick about. Hey, Mario, could you grab me just a basket real quick? Sure. Just sure. an empty basket. Oh, you know what? I got one right here. I'm just, I have got to move these out of my line of sight. I'm literally swiping them into a basket. Here we are. Ah, I just felt like I was running out of room. Okay. So the nice thing about having that snowy, beautiful, gritty, yummy texture um, is that we, we can create these wintry effects with this paste. I'm just going to move this out as well. I'll take anything you want All right. No, 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 you're fine. Thanks. I just wanted to move some stuff. Thank you. Okay, so with this, I always show the swatches on white, white or craft, okay? And I think that that's really not explaining exactly what this stuff does, okay? The Snowfall Grit Paste is designed to look like snow and look like ice. So there are stencils that I've designed. This is one I've, I've said it every year. Like this is my all-time favorite ever of stencils, 21. It's a great splatter. Uh, it's great for metallics, great for inks, but it is my favorite snow of all time because of all the different sizes, the little speckly fleckles, as I like to call them. This one's not available in mini, just from the complexity. This is cut by a laser. So there's a laser that's cutting each one of these holes independently, every stencil. This doesn't go through some rolling die cut machine to cut these. These are done, Stampers Anonymous does this by laser. So every little detail is cut by one laser beam at a time per stencil. So I know this one is really intense to do and you can't do it as a mini because these can't get any smaller, but it is so amazing to create snowy scenes. So when you apply this to a transparency, it dries like ice. So it's translucent at some fact, but it also has just that texture of ice. Now with the new shattered transparency, I was very happy. Um, normally if I'm going to apply this to a transparency, it could be any kind of clear. It could be shrink plastic. It could be, this is shrink plastic because I like how thick it is, uh, but it could be any kind of acetate or transparency. With the introduction of shattered at Halloween, I had to do a shattered window for Christmas because I, I don't know, I imagine something like the Griswolds with like a tree shooting out of the crack window. I don't know, but I love the fact that when you put this on, you can take any of the windows. So we have baseboard windows as a, as a regular skew. These are, these are just heavy bookboard windows. We launch them for Halloween and I'm about to show you a sneak peek in a second. Um, and Paula is probably just gr gripping the side of her chair right now because she probably saw a peek. But here, look at how beautiful that is to have a snowy window scene, especially a shattered one. Um, because it looks like icy snow through a stencil. It's absolutely beautiful when you put it behind a window, especially if you're doing a shaker card. So maybe you wouldn't do a shaker card with shattered, but if you did, you could have all sorts of different things under it. If you were going to do any kind of ice, this one, this stencil that people are like, what is that? Is that like landscape? This is actually snow. So this is where you can take this and place it on the top of a card, mask off whichever size you want, do your snowfall, and then it could look like that snowy bank. It could also go across the midline of a card and you could have a die cut stand on it, right? Because it just looks like that snowy snow cap. That's what this stencil is, but it's only ever visible like this. And it's like, what is that crazy thing? It's really meant for this, this paste in particular. This is an oldie. This is where you can ink up a tree. And then this is a layer that can add snow or ice, but this is great just to use it by itself where you could take this and just add that snowy ice to it. You don't actually have to use the solid tree. It's got enough design that you could place this and use this stencil on a card and it will look like a snowy tree. You don't need to use the base. So there's a lot of ideas for, for utilizing snow, but there is a product that we have coming out for ideology launches next week, but I'm going to share it in this live because I was inspired and I wanted to, and I thought this is the time for the demo. 
But in our baseboard pack for Christmas, we did these amazing storefronts. This was inspired, I think, by one of the envelope Natifa did a long time. These are baseboards and take a look at the size of these. Like they're big. These beautiful storefront windows inspired by uh, shops in, in England. These are actual photographs that we went in and created. These are the most complex baseboards we've ever done because look at how many windows are cut out of chipboard. Pretty amazing. It also comes with these great leaded glass transparencies. There's many other things in the pack, but I'm only showing you just to highlight this particular uh, idea. So these different size leaded glass windows can go behind here to create that really cool vintage storefront. But what's great about Snowfall is that if you place a transparency, be that clear or be that one of the printed ones, you adhere it to the back of the baseboard. I just use tape. So you can use score tape, whatever, just to tape it down. I don't glue it. I use tape. It's much quicker. And then I just take a brush. Now, if you can get yourself a little roundy brush, I'm sure this has a fancy name for painters, but get something that is not going to be long. A long brush is going to make a mess. It needs to be a short little brush. You just scoop up some of the snowfall on the tip of the brush. You already have your transparency attached and then you just like scrape it off, pick up more, scrape it off, pick up more, scrape it off and you get what you get. It lands however it wants. Could you go back and do more? Yes. But if you paint it on the transparency, you're going to see it, but it dries in that clear, icy, wintry look. Any that I get on the baseboard, I just wipe it off while it's wet. But I just think that's so wonderful to have a snowy looking window. And the reason this looks more like snow than this one looks more icy is that this is more compact because it's kind of built up and you get that great texture. Isn't that wonderful? So I wanted to share that um, when, you're, when you're using, especially with these that are coming out uh, next week in the Ideology Christmas line, really great to do these little storefront windows. It doesn't take long at all. Uh, to add that snowy scene would be great on, on a vignette, a card, like the snowy window is everything. So just keep that in mind when you're doing it. This also makes great sand, right? You can mix that with crit paste to kind of thin out the color and you could do something beachy. But I think for, for the winter is really, it's, it's quite cool whether we're doing snow little flecks or whether we're doing uh, a snowy window, really important to, to remember all the things. So Gosh, I think I shared a lot of stuff. Ooh, I do. I, so I think it was, stuff. you know, everything from snowy to sparkly. Let's, I mean, I can't wait to take all these photos. Let's not forget like a bazillion colors of sparkle. My word. So good. We have these. Can I see those tags that we tried, Mario? Because I remember those rainbow tags. I can't get those out of my oh, head. Sure. Those kind of cleanup tags. Yeah, Thanks. I love these with the sparkle where we just kind of blended those colors in. Mm -mm. So good where we did a print, thanks, a print and a monoprint, remember those, embossed paper, remember that, rainbowy, remember that, oh my gosh, oh, see, I knew these were going to come out good, these were the cleanup, I just wanted to, to show you, remember the cleanup of that, take a look at these tags, with all the color of just, that's why you always want like a stack of something, oh, look at that, because you just, you don't know, and these, like letting it air dry, you get what you get, and you you don't throw a fit. You're happy with it. But this is really, I think, how you can be creatively productive. If you just, you have to step out of your head. Thinking is really overrated. Um, you just kind of do it. And if you have no agenda, and this is what I always try to remind people, if you can try to, try to get in the habit, try to maybe retrain your imagination to, to not always have agenda-based creativity. Agenda-based meaning every time you sit down to make something, you you have a specific thing in mind. Like, I'm going to make this. This is like, I want to create this. This is my agenda. The problem with that is it leads to disappointment most of the time because, you know, you don't just want to play around with color. You don't want to just do backgrounds. You're like, I need to make this. I'm going to do all these steps and make a card. And that's okay. But if that's the only time you create, you don't allow your yourself to just experiment and say, what if? Well, if I don't like it, okay, you may not like it for a spring themed card, okay, because that's what you were making according to your agenda. But if you were sitting down making backgrounds and this was a cleanup, you'd be like, this is going to be cool for a moody background or a wildflower or Halloween. It, it changes your creative perspective. It honestly does. And I say it and I think sometimes people just think I'm a lot of blah, 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 but I, I know how in my head I used to be for years. Even as a designer of product, 
I was in my head about everything having to be exactly how I envisioned it all the time and never open to see another side of it. And when the makers came on board, it, it totally shifted my perspective to be like, man, if you're open to stuff, imagine what you can, what you can learn. So, so cool.